Hello, good evening, and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Peep Show with myself, Neil Geddes Ward, and Andrew Chaplin. Hi, Andy, how are you? Hi, folks, uh, thanks for listening and joining in. We've got a wonderful guest this evening. Yeah, Andy, would you do the honours of introducing our guest for tonight? I can indeed. Um, this is uh, a man very familiar to yourself and myself who uh, often goes to the High Wycombe uh, Paranormal Meetup, uh, Ben Emlyn Jones, and uh, he used to be a hospital porter. Uh, which hospital was it, Ben? Remind me. John Radcliffe in Oxford. John Radcliffe in Oxford. Excellent, excellent. And um, Ben, I understand you're going to be talking about some of the um, inc- incidents, I suppose you could call, uh, surrounding um, Helen Duncan and yeah. the whole controversy there, and, and also some of the uh, the sceptics' point of view as well. Yeah, I'll try. I'll, we'll cover as much as we can. I'm sure we can get through a lot of that. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Andy. So, um, Ben, yeah, if we could just have a little bit of a background about you. As, as Andy said, that you were formerly a hospital porter. You also present your own uh, radio show as well. So could you give uh, listeners who don't know much about you a brief kind of introduction to yourself and your work? Well, I do. My uh, Certainly. My uh, website is called um, HPANWO, Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. And um, it's very much a multimedia thing. I have, like, like you said, I have my own radio show. I also do YouTube videos. I uh, write fiction, um, and some of my fiction is published on the, on one of my websites. And um, I write. I write. I, I have a new site which I try to update as often as possible every day if I can. And, Do you want to give um, us the quick, um, the quick URL of uh, the websites that you've got Yes, um, H-P-A-N-W-O. I, I pronounce it H-P-A-N-W-O. H-P-A-N-W-O.blogspot.com. That's the main site. It's also the portal to all the other sites. Fantastic. And we, we're actually going to go into the second half as to why it's called the Hospital Porters specifically, because a lot of people will be wondering what the Hospital Porters bit is against the yeah. New World Order. Um, so certainly the second half will we'll, um, we'll cover that. And the first half, uh, we're going to be talking about Helen Duncan. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so Ben, um, obviously you, you've done talks for the High Wycombe Paranormal Group, which which I run in High Wycombe in Bucks in the UK, and Andy comes along, and, and you yourself have, have come along uh, and done interviews for us on video, but also you've done a few talks on zombies and things like that. Now, you've also done a presentation on Helen Duncan. Um, now, can you, obviously, let, let's talk about it. Who, who was Helen Duncan? Yeah, the study called Helen Duncan is actually, I think, one of the most interesting people I've ever come across. Now, she uh, was born in Calendar in Scotland in, 18, in 1897, and um, in 1944, she became the last person ever to be uh, imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. This was a very archaic law. It's one of these laws that is was um, created in the time of the Enlightenment, which basically was... Um, it was I can't remember the exact, the full text of it, but it was um, it, to, to um, those Something. who pretend the the conjuration of spirits and things like that. Those who prevent using uh, clever trickery and things like that. It's basically to keep fake mediums in line. Mm. That's what I that just, was just intended for. I think I think it was something along the lines of not using tools to conjure spirits or something of that. Yeah, nature. it's yeah. basically it was it was one of the worst fools for sceptic laws. However, by uh, by the twentieth century, it was pretty much. Um, it was pretty much just uh, one of these sort of like uh, vestigial laws that uh, was only on the statute books because nobody could bother to get enough MPs together to officially repeal it. Mm-hmm. So it hadn't been used actually, been used hardly at all actually since um, the previous, the middle of the previous century. Yet the um, the government actually um, got out this archaic law. They dusted it off and they used it to prosecute this uh, this lady Helen Duncan. Um, um, she was what you call a medium. A psychic medium, someone who uh, channels the spirits of the deceased. And was she doing that all her life? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, she, from a very young age, um, ever since she was a little girl, she had what you might call psychic experiences. She was um, nicknamed Hellish Nell when she was a little girl because of her various... Um, it had more to do with her personality, actually, than her <laughs> abilities. But she was quite fiery and um, quite um, volatile, shall we say. But... Mm. Um, she also uh, had the ability to perceive things. She she had um, she actually managed to um, use what would today be called remote viewing, and this came in very handy at one point because uh, someone actually I remember uh, someone of the uh, who lived in a local community once got lost in a very very bitter winter storm, and um, uh, they actually the search party actually took Helen with them, and she was only about five years old at the time, but they took her with them. 
because they uh, she could actually guide them to she said she could guide them to where the man was so even at a very young age this her skill was well known to the local people and um, I think they respected her because they did manage to find this man they managed to find this man um, before he died because he would have died of cold if he hadn't been found so uh, did she locate him with what you say is like uh, you know um, homing in on him in the traditional kind of um mediumistic way was she asking spirits or was she doing a remote viewing technique do you think to, to locate him i'm not sure i'm not sure what it was i this is from um a very interesting book that i read on helen and it said that um it explained basically a bit of her background she also had um she used to uh, write so uh, she when she was at school and she couldn't answer a question she used to put the school book under her chair and she put it out later and someone had written in the answers that's another anecdote from her early life so that, if someone else had written in the answers physically in a book, it, that's a very mysterious phenomenon there. It's yes, almost extremely. Like, it's almost like physical materialization or physical mediumship to a certain extent, um, but it was actually happening in a classroom or a school, not in a darkened room or blacked out room or anything like that. It's very, yeah. very, very kind of uh, unique individual there. She was actually part of this very, very unique and uh, exclusive class of um, psychic medium, as, which, as you say, are materialization mediums. They, they're so physical... Sorry, but did, did she have a, um, a a spiritualist background or any kind of like circle training, development training, or was it kind of like a natural thing that just, she just kind of flowed with? I don't know. I mean, based on the early age which she d demonstrated these abilities, I'd say it was something natural. I don't know whether she had any proper development or not. Mm. Do you know if she had any um, contact with? Uh, actually, funny enough, uh, when were the Fox Sisters? That was earlier, wasn't it? That was, that was much. That was a long time earlier. That was yeah. actually in the eighteen. 1840s, I believe, in the United yeah, States. Um, interesting thing about the Fox Sisters, I mean, if you ask the skeptics, they'll tell you that the Fox Sisters actually confessed to having faked their, their, everything they did. However, there's reason to believe that their confession was actually insincere and it was made because they just because they couldn't tolerate what they were doing. They couldn't cope with the lifestyle they were living anymore, so they wanted to get out of it. Yeah. But um, Helen. Um, Helen actually did actually uh, actually grew older. I mean, whether she went to a development circle or not, she began to pr she began to practice as a full time psychic spiritualist medium. By the nineteen twenties, she was established in that respect, and um, she b made a healthy living, which I think is fair enough. I mean, her husband was very ill; he couldn't work. She had eight children, so this was basically the only way she could avoid bringing them up in poverty. She did practice. Um, she became very famous. She travelled the country. I mean, I don't know if she ever went abroad. But she became very, very well known, and um, this obviously drew the attention of the, the psychical research community. And um, this is where she she was actually invited to London to take part in a uh, psychical research project. And um, the London Spiritualist Alliance, which today is called the London College of Psychic Studies, it changed its name. Uh, they actually um, hosted a they actually had her in the, the laboratories, and they were doing tests on her. Um, it all fell apart, though, because she'd, it was a very complicated situation in which the skeptics, again, mis misrepresented. They, mis she, they claim that the skeptics, the skeptics claim that Helen Duncan failed the tests that she was put under and that um, she, was, she was not actually materialising any, any ectoplasm. She was actually materialising cheesecloth. But uh, there's several reasons to doubt that. Firstly, um, Helen signed an exclusivity contract for the London Spiritualist Alliance when she, when she arrived. There'd been a bidding process. And um, basically, um, there's a guy called Harry Price who was uh, who was a very, who was a lone maverick in the field, and he had bidded to uh, he had put in a bid to actually have Helen Duncan in his laboratory, and he'd lost to the, the the LSA. I don't know exactly what the rules were, but they basically Helen was the exclusive property of the um, concern of the um, LSA. However, Price contacted her secretly and asked him to do some. Uh, to do some experiments in his laboratory as well and not to tell the LSA. Hmm. So uh, Helen actually broke this exclusivity contract. I think she probably didn't quite understand what she was getting involved in and didn't really, un really understand the seriousness of the issue. But um, there was a big um, fight over it. There was a big uh, row that was generated from this uh, between Price and the LSA. And Helen was caught in the middle of it and she walked out of the process, the whole... Um, the whole experiment of both both organizations so the hmm. studies were basically not completed 
So, so surprise, surprise, he was um, involved in Borley Rectory, I believe. Was that the Yeah, he, he was some quite well known. He was, he was some quite well known through the, in that era. He died in 1948, but he was um, before then. He was very. He he got the impression of being um, um, an, a believer in the paranormal, but essentially a debunker. So he was in a position that he accepted that some paranormal phenomena were real, but he spent most of his time focusing on um, what he would consider solved cases or easy to solve cases. So it became a. Um, and there are some characters like that today, actually, I, I could mention, um, who are quite similar, who, who have a similar attitude. And I sometimes think they. I would say, well, I wish they focused on the cases which were they couldn't solve rather than those they, they could. But it appears that the. Um, both the LSA and Price were a little bit felt a bit humiliated by Helen and her and various what she was doing. So there's a kind of rush to the line to publish first um, a, a, a paper denouncing her as a fraud. But so the, the actual story of, of what so Price, so Harry Price, and instantly he has a website uh, which you can go look at today, HarryPrice.com. He didn't set up that up himself because I said he died in 1948. One of his fans did. But um, you can read his paper on Helen Duncan. And it's really quite remarkable because he said that she had actually... Um, there's some photographs of Helen um, in trance exuding ectoplasm. Ectoplasm is this material that physical mediums um, are said to issue from the body. It sometimes comes from the mouth or nose or even from underneath the fingernails, which forms into shapes which are recognisable as spirits. This is, uh, the, uh, this is what a materialisation medium does. There, there are apparently only six materialisation mediums in the world today. It's that rare. And you won't find them down your local spiritualist church very often. But um, what Price said Helen was doing was, um, oh, she's um, swallowing cheesecloth. She swallows a massive piece of cheesecloth and then holds it in her stomach and then regurgitates it. She throws it up and, to makes, it, and makes it look like um, a spirit, like ectoplasm, because she was searched from head to foot. Helen was stripped naked. It's, she had a, there was a female nurse called Mary McGinley who actually poked and prodded her in every part of her body from head to toe. But she actually wasn't hiding anything in her, in her person. And um, so she said, oh, but they didn't check her stomach. So uh, Price actually d demanded that she was x-rayed and she refused to be x-rayed. But I mean, but that's not the reason she refused to be x-rayed because she was basically in a temper with Price. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, it takes an awful lot of... Um, uh, it takes a very, very broad imagination to, 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 to conclude this was happening, especially when Price actually only produced a small amount of this cheesecloth. He said it was cheesecloth and rubber gloves and tissue paper and egg whites. That's what she said this was. The Helen had swallowed, held in her stomach, and then regurgitated in the laboratory to produce this effect. Um, you think he managed to get a bigger bit of it first of all, not just a little piece of it. Um, secondly, and, and I, I would say if they're so if they're so keen on this um, concept and they think this is how it's done, why can't they find someone to reproduce it? Why can't they, in a scientific manner, try and do exactly what they've just said? It's quite a feat, isn't it? To think that <laughs> it you is. Take, you can take a piece of, of, of textile which is about six foot square, swallow it, <laughs> hold it in your stomach, bring it up, throw it up like vomit it. And then swallow it again without without using your hands mm. and without making a big mess everywhere because what you know how could she regurgitate this cheesecloth and not this morning's breakfast and, and without um, the retching noise that you would definitely hear you would definitely yeah. hear a retching noise also I, mean, yeah, I was going to say also produce it into a facsimile of, of a human being as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> with yeah. her hands strapped to a chair yeah. And um, there's a guy called Will Goldston who was chairman of the Magic Circle at the time, and he actually hosted Helen Duncan at his his own pro his own premises, his own home, uh, which is also in London at around the same time, which is 1930. And this is what happened in 1930. And um, he uh, said something very differently. He said that he he's a magician. He knows how he knows about fake mediums because he's he, he he's encountered them. And he he said he checked her, he tied her up, and he made sure she was very very well um, bound and everything. And um, he observed what she was doing, and he said quite clearly she's not using any of this trickery. She actually had she actually consumed a cup of coffee and some tea cakes while he was with her. And um, there's no way he said so. How could she have done this and then held this stuff in her stomach? It doesn't make sense. I mean, one one of the skeptics said she's got a double stomach. Well, I mean, it's very, it's very. You see, I mean, um, I don't know if that's possible in humans. I know cows have multiple stomachs, but um, actually, she had had X-rays taken of her at a later date, which showed she has a perfectly normal stomach. 
Mm. Just like anybody else. What what I find absolutely gobsmacking is that supposed scientific, rational minded people were coming up with theories that are just wacky, crazy, just insane theories and then yeah. taking them seriously. I mean what the hell? Well this is something we can talk about later when I bring up the skeptic subject in greater detail. Mm. But I mean they there's this kind of idea that um non par all that non paranormal Otherwise, they use the word mundane, or even a rational explanation. Which a rational explanation is in itself a misnomer. If they say rational explanation, they're essentially tipping their hand, because um, an, an explanation can never be rational. Only a method can. Mm. Um, you can have a, an explanation which comes from rational process, a rational method, or an irrational method. But the moment you start saying, well, the explanation is rational, you're essentially saying it's, a, it's one that skeptics like. It's an explanation that skeptics like. Mm. And they say things like, well, we have to consider non-paranormal phenomena first before we, all non-paranormal um, possibilities, any physically possible non-paranormal possibility, before we consider paranormal possibilities. And there's no real explanation about why that um, is a moral imperative to begin with. Mm. Is there, why, why do you have to do that? Because then the moment you start saying, well, anything physically possible could explain that, Debunking, you, you you really get into the area where um, explaining away something paranormal become, becomes essentially an exercise of the imagination. Mm. I could say, for instance, the Rendlesham Forest incident of 1980, which was a UFO encounter. People are saying, well, it was they just the the witnesses just saw a lighthouse. It wasn't a UFO. It was just a lighthouse. And um, we say, well, how do you know that when they didn't describe anything? It looks like a lighthouse. And you can answer, well, a lighthouse is a non is a non-extraterrestrial explanation, and I thought of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see what I mean? It's um, mm. this is one of the fallacies the, the, of the sceptic movement. And one of the problems is, of course, is the very term paranormal is entirely subjective. So, let's say ghosts exist. Um, well, it's normal within the realms of kind of like the ghostly world or among mediums. Among, among the psychics and the mediums community, if they see a ghost, that is normal to them from their perspective. It's only paranormal to people who have not seen ghosts and are not in that community. Everything's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's a perception. Um, well, the phrase paranormal, it, it, it simply means things we don't understand, phenomena we don't yet understand. Mm. Um, you go back a few centuries and lightning was paranormal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, there was a time when bats were considered to have paranormal abilities to um, navigate in the dark. It turns mm. out that they were using echolocation. Um, yeah. For sound. So, <laughs> so paranormal is just one of these things. I mean, it could... It's it's possible that we may one day find out exactly what UFOs, ghosts, other things like that are. Mm. We explain them within the realms of our own ability to understand, but we're not at that point yet. This... So, ben, so Ben, let's kind of like maybe drift back onto Helen Duncan and and, yeah. and and kind of connect that to the Second World War and how it began. So let's let, let's kind of like go on to maybe 1939, the beginning of yeah. the war, and, and what she was up to then. Yes, that's right. Helen uh, continued to practice after this um, ill-fated um, psychological experiment that was a psychical research experiment that was done in 1930. And um, she had a few run-ins with a few people. Um, she was in court at one point and um, fined 10 shillings uh, for supposedly being a fake medium. Now, 1939, World War II broke out. And um, her business boomed. She became very, very well, um, very, very much needed because, of course, we were losing people, especially in the first part of the war. We lost a lot of uh, soldiers. Uh, and also the Blitz was in um, full swing, which meant that uh, in the end, 60,000 people, I think, died in the Blitz. And people were spending night times in their air raid shelters in the garden and things like that. They were carrying gas masks around with them, things like that. Um, it's, um, so Helen was very much required, and she travelled um, in many, many, many places. And one of those places was um, uh, called the Master Temple in Portsmouth. And uh, this is actually, despite its grandiose name, it's actually just a little room above a chemist shop. But today it's a jewellery sh Today it's a jewellery shop. I've actually been there, and it's just someone lives there. It's a flat. Mm -hmm. It's a lounge in the flat, you know. And um, so Helen visited the Master Temple many times. It was run by Mr. and Mrs. Homer, the couple that ran the chemist shop. And um, now in 1941, something remarkable happened. Um, she, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, she was in um, the Master Temple doing a, a seance, and um, Albert, her 
Albert. Albert is the name of her spirit guide. And this was a man who, in his previous incarnation in a physical body, had lived in Australia and had died around about 1900. And he was a tall man with a strong Australian accent. And he came through and he announced to the uh, audience who were in the temple, in the Master Temple, um, I'm very sorry to have to tell you that a British battleship has just been sunk. I have uh, 1,400 of her officers and men newly arrived in the spirit world with me. And there's a big gasp in the audience. What do you mean a British battleship's just been sunk? And fatefully, one of the people in the audience was a man called Brigadier Roy Firebrace. Now, he was head of army intelligence for Scotland. And he was also um, a, very keen on psychical research. He was um, a member of the so Society for Psychical Research. He was a, a spiritualist. He was an occultist. He knew Alistair Crowley. And um, so he... He was very, very concerned about this. So, but he, um, this is why he was, he attended seances like this. But he went back to his office and he got on the um, secure phone to the Admiralty in London. In London, he said, "Excuse me, I just had a, been to, I, you wouldn't believe this. I've just been, been to heard a psychic medium talking about a British battleship being sunk. Is that true?" And they said, "Oh no, no, it's not true, sir. It's, uh, it's, um, it must be a mistake." So he breathed a sigh of relief and put the phone down. Anyway, a few hours later. This, this same person called him back to actually issue a correction. I'm sorry, we have actually lost a, a battleship. Uh, we've lost HMS Hood. She was sunk in the um, he was sunk by in a in a battle off the in the North Sea with Prince Eugen, which is a big German battleship, and uh, went down with 1,400 hands. And Firebrace was astonished. I mean, he knew immediately what this involved. He knew that basically. Helen Duncan was giving away uh, information about the war, through, which was not through the alternate, through the main me mainstream media sources. Now, this meant she could give away classified information. Um, this is um, and this what she rep if she did that, that would mean she represented an unpluggable leak. I mean, you know the phrase, yeah, you know, we had to kill him because he knew too much. It's a cliche in spy thriller thrillers, books, and films. But what do you do when you can't silence someone even by killing them? <laughs> so it was a very he must have been very very worried about this and you could bet that somebody kept a, a very close eye on Helen Duncan and we know in fact we know almost certainly that's the case for, for various reasons including a letter which is still in the possession of uh, Firebrace's daughter who's still alive in which he writes to the head of the head of intelligence at that time specifically recommending that Helen Duncan be watched and it got worse because um, in November of that same year, 1941, Helen was back at the Master Temple and Albert came forward and he said, I'm very sorry, but we've lost another British battleship. I have 700 of our officers and men newly arrived from the spirit world. And one of these guys appeared, he, uh, one of the sailors. He actually appeared in spirit, in ectoplasm, dressed in his uniform, his little square rig with a little cap, which says HMS on it. And... Um, one of the uh, sitters was his mother and recognised him and broke down in tears. Um, now, what, what happened in this case was very, very worrying for the government because, from their point of view, because they actually had decided to keep this secret, but a ship had sunk. It was actually HMS Barham, uh, an Admiral-class battlecruiser, very similar to Hood. And it's one of the most powerful uh, warships the Royal Navy possessed, actually, a major surface combatant. And uh, she'd gone down in the Mediterranean, sunk by a U-boat, and um, her loss was it was a major blow to the war effort. And this came at a time just after Dunkirk, when the Blitz was in full swing, and no one knew how the war was going to go. I mean, we know it because we see it through retrospect, through history, but at the time, people was in the middle of it. No one knew where it was gonna what was going to happen. So the government, to, to keep morale up on the home front, they decided to keep the sinking of HMS Barham secret. And even, even some of the relatives of the of the deceased had not been told. Some of them had been sent memos just saying, "Look, just don't tell anyone." Secret courier delivered messages, which they had to, um, which they could, they couldn't keep. They had to destroy them afterwards. So um, basically, most people, very few few people knew about it, and it was not. It was only the following year it was revealed officially in the news. Now, for whatever reason, um, they decided to let Helen Duncan go on practicing, and they didn't pull her in straight away. They just let her carry on, but they must have been watching her. Now, you go, go forward a few years, J January 1944. Helen Duncan is doing an another seance at the Master Temple, and um, there's a police raid, and she's arrested. 
and uh, she was charged with uh, um, under the 1735 Witchcraft Act. If found guilty, she could, she could find herself in jail for nine months. And she was not tried at the local... She was expecting to be dragged to the local magistrate's court, given a fine, whatever, let go, under the Vagrancy Act, which is the red legislation that was normally used. But instead, she was, this, was just, this trial was held at the Old Bailey, at the Central Criminal Court in London. And she couldn't... She must have been absolutely out of her depth. She must have been absolutely horrified and confused over what was happening. And so, uh, basically, they, they took her there and they, they gave her a trial and she was found guilty. And now the, 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 the prosecution uh, must have come up with reasons why, or, or at least how she got the information. I mean, um, from memory, I think the government took the position, or the prosecution took the position, that she was a German enemy agent, that she was working for the Nazis. Um, but then that, that raises the question, well, why on earth is she, is she doing seances, talking about all these um, ships sinking? And, you know, how does that play into the hands of um, Hitler? Well, if she had been working for the other side, it would be—I mean, it would be very. She'd she'd get a lot more. Um, she'd be taken a lot more seriously because the Nazis took the paranormal very seriously. They they used um, remote viewers and psychics of their own, including this um, medium called Sylvia Ortiz, who was used by the um, SS um, to uh, to spy on the enemy. Mm. But um, the government officially had uh, was a very sceptic government in Britain officially. But I mean, the talk about the prosecution is very interesting. Um, I mean, they, they obviously they were worried because um, they knew that if because our by our intelligence organisations were watching, were watching it. There was a, a unit called B nineteen was probably just p deployed to keep an eye on her because this was a wartime unit a division of MI five, which would have been which was used to track sources of rumours. It's human intelligence, and um, so uh, so he. So I think they were watching. They were. They must have been keeping an eye on. They must have known that if their side were watching them, you could bet the enemy was as well, because the, the word would have got around. Now, in, in the prosecution is very interesting because the pro the chief uh, the uh, chief um, prosecution barrister was a guy called um, John Cyril Maud KC, who was a very very experienced barrister. He's one of the best in the country, which is why the the, the crown would have wanted that as their prosecution counsel. But. Um, What's most interesting about Elam is that he, sorry, Elam, he had, a, he had an assistant called Henry Elam, yeah. What's, it, what's interesting about Maud is that he was head of Section B-19 in the, for MI5. Um, in the war, most people had more than one job, and very often they were involved in the war effort, even if they had a, a, a day job, which they normally did. Um, now, there was um, another chap involved, uh, the chief prosecution witness was called... Um, uh, West, um, Arthur West, Lieutenant, um, no, sorry, what was his name? Oh, it's PC Rupert Cross and I can't, what, I can't remember the, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the, um, what's interesting is there's a guy, there's some documents been uncovered to indicate that Maud was actually reporting to someone called Commander Ian Fleming, who was the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence at that time, and one of the most experienced intelligence agents in the country, spied on the Moscow show trials. He also spied on the uh, um, Spanish Civil War, and he was into psychical research. He was a—he knew Alistair Crowley. He was a member. He knew Brigadier Roy Firebrace, and he uh, knew um, several other people within. The, he knew Harry Price, so he was very much on Firebrace's level. So Fleming and Firebrace were very much on the same level, and they must have conferred behind the scenes. Does the name Ian Fleming sound familiar to you? <laughs> da -da 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 -da. <laughs> yeah, he created the James Bond novels. He created James Bond, and. Um, yeah, um, yeah, these, uh, yeah, he's, uh, that's right, um, he created the James Bond novel, <laughs> uh, which, of course, spawned a very, very, uh, a very, ex an extremely, um, successful film franchise. Hmm. And in actual fact, he, he um, used the code name for Bond as 007, which was actually, yeah. I believe, Elizabeth I's, um, one of her spies, um, way, way back in, um, Oh God! When was that? Fifteen hundred second sixteen. That's right. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. He did indeed. Um, yeah. This is um. Now that's, I should get my notes out. Sorry about this. I should remember Sorry. these things. But when I'm on uh, the radio, I sometimes have trouble. But wasn't one of the spies of Elizabeth I, whether it's the same chap or not? Wasn't he also a psychic or a medium or an astrologer or something? Or John I, D was I, he? Yeah. Think, I think it's John D, and I think yeah. he used to sign his name as 007. Yeah. And obviously Fleming got hold of that and kind of like used that for Bond. Mm. So yeah, yeah. So Fleming was very much of a 
almost like a secret occultist, you could say, mm. perhaps. Which, um, well, it's, it's, yeah. There was a oh, strange yeah. kind of like paradox within the medieval times and, and beyond, because although things like that, like psychics and mediums and things were very much condemned and you could be hung as a witch and burnt at the stake and all that kind of thing, but in the very upper echelons, the very kind of like elitist levels, it seemed to be kind of okay. Um, they did actually have their astrologers, they did actually have their kind of their fortune tellers, um, but for some reason the lower masses, if they started dabbling in it, then they would be up for uh, witch hunts uh, um, trials and all, all sorts. I, I think nothing's changed, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But you know what they're doing in society today, aren't they? You yeah. Know? You know, the funny thing about Fleming is well, one of the James Bond films, I mean, I've never read any of the books, but one of the James Bond films is called Live and Let Die. Oh, yes. And it is centred around voodoo and tarot. And it has, that's um, right. And mm, there's like right. a, the, the, the chief bad guy is like this voodoo priest. And he has this like priestess with who does tarot cards. Baron Samedi. Um, yeah, it's a very, very good, um, very good film indeed. One of the best ones. Now, um, the chief prosecution witness was called, it, it got back to Helen Duncan again, was a guy called Lieutenant Stanley Raymond Worth. Now, Worth is very interesting because he lied, un- he, he lied under oath because uh, the, the defence counsel, a guy called um, uh, Cros, not Crossley, what? What's, I quite can't remember these names. It's Helen Duncan coming through from yeah. the other side. What's his name? <laughs> I've been talking about this non-stop and suddenly I've forgotten his name Lowsby, Charles Lowsby the um, ch- defence counsel he said are you a member of the intelligence services he asked him and he really cross-examined Worth Worth said no sir I'm not but he lied he was a member of the uh, special investigation division of the, the Navy Provost so he's the kind of guy who would have been employed to keep an eye on Helen I mean and be reporting to Maud and reporting to Fleming and he was assisted by another policeman called PC Rupert Cross, and they were actually in the audience. This is how the raid of, of January on January the nineteenth, nineteen forty-four. This is how it was organised. Basically, Worth and Cross were in the audience and uh, pretending to be just normal sitters dressed in plain clothes. And they were outside there was some outside there was some police hiding. And basically, at the right moment, uh, Worth stood up, switched on a torch. They had torches with them, and they blew a whistle. And the police just burst in. In a matter of moments, they were up the stairs and into the ke- out through the chemist shop, up the stairs, and into the séance room. And arrested Helen. They detained everyone there. So now Worth. It was very funny because Worth said he he did, did it for fun. He used to go to séances. He didn't believe any of it, but he was just a bit of a laugh. He called it going to the spooks. He and his friends, you know, this it would be like a lads' night out. We're not going to go to the pub tonight, lads. Let's go to the spooks. And which is odd because it's it's not it's quite expensive. It cost twelve shillings, which was a lot of money in those days. But they used to go to the spooks. Didn't say how he could afford it in wartime, but um, that's what he did. And um, he said when he realised that Helen Duncan was a fraud, because he saw just pr- he saw Helen Duncan prancing around covered in this sheet, this white, big white sheet. It must have been a big sheet, because if you see pictures of Helen Duncan, you'll you'll see she's no ballerina. She's a big lady. So a um, big, big, huge sheet, and um, and said, uh, you know, oh, she's fraud. So I'm gonna, I'm. I'm going to bring her to justice. It's my duty. I'm, and he told he told Lowsby that he was spying on his own account, whatever the hell that means. But he, that's what he said to her. He said he was had knowing he was completely his. Uh, he decided to do it completely personal motives. And he contacted the police. He told them, and he organised the raid with Chief Constable Arthur West, who was head of the police in Portsmouth. He was a personal family friend of of Worth, and Worth also knew the leader of the police raid. So the the whole prosecution side of this. Of this trial is starting to look like some kind of secret cabal, and and the and the judge as well was the recorder of London, Sir Gerald Dodson. Now he was uh, very sentimental about anything to do with the Royal Navy because he was in, he was involved with Royal Navy charities. So um, yeah, so it's very very. Uh, it sounds to me dodgy as hell. Basically, a little bit of a stitch up job to me. <laughs> yes, dodgy as hell. I would say. Was there a reason for legitimately placing the trial to the Old Bailey, a very high-profile kind of court? Absolutely none. In fact, Winston Churchill wrote to the he wrote to the Home Secretary at one point, and he said, um, "He said, let me have a let me have a report on your convenience why the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was uh, was." Um, and he goes on to say, uh, various, um, 
Let me just find the actual quote. Let me have a report on why the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was used in a modern court of justice. What was the cost of this trial to the state, observing that witnesses were brought from Portsmouth and maintained here in this crowded London for a fortnight? And the recorder kept busy with all this obsolete tomfoolery to the detriment <laughs> of the necessary work to the courts. And this was completely irregular. I mm. mean, Churchill, we know Churchill was a believer in spiritualism, but I mean, this is, he, was, he was not even in the loop. He didn't even know this was going on. <laughs> he, he, he first found out about it when he read about it in the papers. Mm. And um, he was Prime Minister. So this is, it sounds very, very, very dodgy indeed. It's, it's like a very, very large sledgehammer is being used to crack a very small nut. There mm. must have been an ulterior motive. I, it's, I, I, it's, I know it is. Like I, I know what it is. It's, it's almost like um, they're trying to make an example of her to say to other people, if there are mediums out there or however you're getting this information, shut up and don't say anything because it's going to jump <laughs> yeah. the war effort. Yeah, well, yeah. they had a real serious motive here because, um, of course, um, Helen was found guilty. She was um, on the um, 20th of March. Basically, they, um, they, it was all over because they, the jury went out. They considered their verdict. It only took half an hour. She was guilty. And the, and the um, Chief Constable Arthur West, him again, gave Hel Helen such a damning character assessment that the judge had no choice. He had to sentence her for the maximum of nine months in jail. And she was taken to Holloway Prison, a women's prison in London, and kept there. I mean, she got a bit of time knocked off because she'd been she'd been refused bail. She'd been held on remand, and <laughs> so she got a bit of time knocked off for that. But um, why she why she'd be held on in, under bail? I mean, you know, what's what danger would be she be to society? But um, she wasn't released until September. But on the sixth of June, nineteen forty four, what happened? Do you remember Operation Overlord, the mass amphibious landing of Normandy, France, and history comes to know it as D Day. Now, D-Day was planned a long time in advance, and Fleming was involved in it. Commander Ian Fleming was actually involved in the disinformation operation to make the um, the Germans and the um, think that that um, the Allies were going to invade through Italy. He even created fake documents and planted them on a dead body to be found by the enemy. Yeah, this this was a, a tramp, wasn't it? Um, and yeah. I, I believe it was either Crete or Spain, I think, that the, the yeah. body was um, found. But basically, it was put out in, a, in, a, in an RAF uniform and a drop mm. from the plane to make them think it was a pilot who'd, who'd been killed in an aircraft crash. Yeah, yeah. And the, the parachute in the sea, the enemy found the body. This document was on it, and they believed it. Um, but what happened was, I mean, there was so much dis there was so much secrecy. I mean, it was a, what I would call a top-heavy conspiracy. Many, many people were briefed in. There's even a fake village in Somerset they built, and you can go and visit it. It's a mm. museum today. Um, but it, was, um, it would only take one person to die, who was a brief in, and for that person to come through in one of Helen's seances, and for an enemy agent to be in the room, and the secret is blown. And there's more than one person died, because I, this is new information. This is new information that's come about since I, since I did the recording with you, Neil, at the High Wycombe Paranormal Group. Oh, right. In, okay. the, in, November, of, in November of 1943, a... Um, a ship, one of those landing, one of those landing ships, those infantry landing vessels with the, the big drawbridge at the front of the, over the bows. Oh, right, like an amphibious landing thing with yeah. wheels and stuff. Yeah, you've seen them on you've seen them on the movies where they, they land on the beach and the troops come out. One of those yeah, landing landing craft. Yeah, yeah, it was exercising off the coast of uh, of Dorset and it sunk. And I think all the people it was fully loaded with troops and they all drowned. So there was a good couple of hundred guys floating around in the in the Altons, waiting for a chance to come through, who knew about D-Day. And the government, all they had to do was they had to shut Helen up. They had to get her out of the, out of the, off the spiritualist scene just until D-Day. So that's so why they did it. It almost seems, it almost seems like the government um, were forced to believe in a weird way because if if they discounted the fact that she was a German spy and I, and I don't know if they went with that or not or truly believed that or not if the only other option was she was getting this psychically it's almost like they're forced to accept that she is in fact a medium and it is coming from some etheric world yeah it's, it's honestly even if um, I mean whether in a sense I mean I I personally believe that she was a it, I, I personally think she was actually a real psychic medium, but I mean, whether she was or not, is kind of a, a separate issue to the fact that pe many, many people in very high positions in the in the wartime Britain thought she was. They took her seriously. 
Yeah, yeah, they did. The 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 interesting thing that comes to mind is that why didn't they? Uh, and this is probably why, probably because uh, it would have proved um, too too much of a hot potato, perhaps in a, in a court of law, that she was allowed to demonstrate her mediumistic abilities. Well, this is what she wanted to do. This is what she wanted to do. She wanted to actually perform in court. This is what I suppose is a mistake um, that uh, Lowsby made. Because, I mean, Lowsby didn't actually cross-examine the, the witnesses, at the Crown's witnesses enough, because he wanted to wait for the next part of the trial, where he hoped to get all the charges against Helen Duncan dropped in one foul swoop through some incredible thing. He would actually have Helen perform a live seance in court. He said he actually actually said this. He said, um, um, "If Mrs. Duncan is a materialization medium, then there is a spirit world near her at this moment, and a guide right here, possibly waiting for an opportunity to help her. Let us call him. Yes, here in the Central Criminal Court of London. Why not? She requires a curtained-off partition and a red light. Nothing more. This is the acid test to which she should be willing to subject herself. I tell you this much: she is so willing." The judge refused point blank. He said no. He's, um, he said he wouldn't do it. Um, Lowsby appealed and they polled the jury and the jury voted not to see the seance in the, in the courtroom. I mean, WTF? I mean, this, this is unbelievable. I mean, if you were on that jury, just for your own personal curiosity, <laughs> wouldn't you want to witness something like that? I think, oh. I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> I, I would have been so gutted if I was on that jury and they all voted not to. I would have been so peed off with them. <laughs> it's, it sounds it sounds completely utterly un, it sounds completely unbelievable uh, that they wouldn't allow. I mean, firstly, I mean, um, I can't remember what was it. What was it? Um, I think it was. Oh, Dodson said spiritualism isn't is not on trial here. Mrs. Duncan is. Hmm. So basically, this was just a technicality, saying, well, basically, it doesn't matter if, she, if she's capable of spiritualism. The fact is, she didn't perform real spiritualism on the 19th of January, 1944. Uh. But, I mean, that's a, ridiculous, that's a ridiculous excuse, because, let's face it, I mean, if, if she had performed and succeeded, then the, then the prosecution would have, to, would have to explain why someone with her abilities would need to fake things. Yeah. So basically, the prosecution case would have fallen apart if Helen had performed in court, mm. and um, so that was it. So um, the trial proceeded, and, and Helen was found guilty. Um, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of weird things. I mean, firstly, a Worth should have been prosecuted for perjury for lying under oath because he said he wasn't in the intelligence services when he was. <laughs> when was that found out, though? Later on, many years later. Or? It was found later. Yeah, it was found out yeah. later on. But um, he should have been prosecuted for that. But he buggered off to New Zealand. I mean, he died actually in the late nineties, and um, he'd been living in New Zealand. And he stood. He was interviewed for a TV documentary in the nineties, and he he stood by his story to his day. Um, but it's really weird because, like, he there's all kinds of weird things. Like he and Cross, his, his accomplice in the in the audience. They said, oh, uh, Helen Duncan is using a white... She's covering herself with this white bedsheet to make herself look like a ghost. Right. Um, and so when they blew the whistle and switched the torches on in the Master Temple, uh, Cross and Worth ran forward and they grabbed this fake ectoplasm. They grabbed this bedsheet while the police were coming in. Right. Um, so this bedsheet really should have been a major court exhibit, wouldn't it? I mean, it's a vital piece of physical evidence. So where was it? Hmm. Vanished. It's 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 lunacy. The the excuses they gave. Oh, someone must have hidden it. We we sort of lost we lost we lost our grip on it, and someone must have hidden it. Let's get it straight. The lights switched on. The police were bursting in. In the chaos of a police raid, they both got their hands on this piece of fake ectoplasm, and somehow they lose it. And the police don't find. I mean, it's. I mean, it, that should it's, be that should be exhibit A, surely. Yeah, of course. This is a big, a big a bed sheet big enough to cover a twenty stone woman. And they lose it. I mean, this. I mean, this is just. It's so obvious that this is fake. This is a complete and utter fabrication. So, there was no bed sheet. Um, for the benefit of listeners who who don't understand the ramifications <laughs> of why physical mediums use a darkened seance room with a red light and uh, why they're behind a cabinet, can you go into the kind of logistics of why all that happens, Ben? Yeah, sure. Well, what basically what happens is that the um, the, the procedure for Helen's mediumship and for physical mediumship is very, very um, simple. I mean, the it's, it's simple in most cases, but Helen's was more complicated. And she actually got the idea to make her own seance procedures more complicated from her experience in 1930 in Harry Price's laboratory. 
Um, she changed after that. She changed her style to include some new additional uh, precautions. What Helen wanted to do, she was absolutely con- very, very important. She felt it was very, very important that people believed her, that believed she was genuine. So she would. Um, what happened was the medium would, would go into the would, would actually change into a different clothing. They would actually change clothing to prove Helen would. This is what Helen did. She would take off her clothes and put on a black, simple black dress, which was tied up with um, with actual string. It wasn't buttons. It was actually tied with string. To make sure she was actually, she was kind of sewn into this dress. But before she was actually, um, before she actually put on this dress, she actually got, she employed a nurse called um, Molly Goldney. Now, you think to yourself, who would actually search her the way that Mary McGinley had done in Price's Laboratory. And it was actually, would poke and prod her from head to toe to make sure she wasn't hiding anything anywhere on her body. Because this was common, this is the trick that fake mediums used to use in those days. Now, um, you think, well, this is the employee of Helen. I mean, you, how can you trust her? Well, you can trust her because she invited female members of the audience to come and watch this being done. This, Helen was actually willing to put herself through this indignity of having total strangers watching her stripped down to a, to, to a birthing suit and being poked and prodded by this nurse because she wanted them to believe that she was real. She wanted to show them that she was not hiding any props on her body. And then she'd go into the, the seance room. Now, the, the seance room it consisted of a row of spectator seats, which was usually just set up. They were often, the, some of these spiritist um, centers were actually normal rooms, and they were used for normal purposes, and they were converted into spiritist centers just for the purposes of the seance. And there would be like a curtained-off cubicle called a cabinet, which would have a curtain pulled across it. And um, the medium, Helen Duncan, would actually sit in the cubicle, and um, then... The lights would be dimmed. Now, they wouldn't be switched off completely. There'd be like a 40-watt red bulb in one, on one light. And um, that would be the only lighting in the room. Now, the skeptics will say this is so that, that she basically, the mediums could carry out magical tricks in the dark when no one could see them. You know, they can, they're, they're, they're props, they're fake, they're fake trumpets and their little bits of string and their pieces of, tr- pieces of ribbon and stuff like that can be used in a way which the audience cannot spot. It's essentially a, a concealment exercise or concealment method. However, according to the um, psychic or psychical community, um, that's actually not what's happening. The, the reason the lights were switched off was in order to prevent um, damage, the, uh, damage to the ectoplasm and, and um, injury to the medium. Because bright lights actually could actually cause injury to the, a medium in trance who was exuding ectoplasm. And this actually did happen to Helen later on. In fact, um, she suffered a really bad injury in 1956, which led directly to her death, I believe. And what, what injury was that, and what were the circumstances? In 1956, I mean, this after Helen came out of jail, she was very, very... She was bitter, she was angry, um, mostly because she didn't... She wanted to perform in court, and she wasn't allowed to. And that really, really upset her. And she was very, very. She was. She'd spent her nine months in jail, and she got out. She. She, she never really got over the, the experience. She went back to practicing mediumship. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 was repealed, and in 19 and in, in 1951 was replaced by the Fraudulent Mediums Act, which was a slight improvement. It was a little bit, a bit fairer than the Witchcraft Act. That was that was only repealed in 2008. But um, the interesting thing about um, about um, Helen was that she. She did. She she kept, she she did have a couple of other brushes with the law. Now, in 1956, she was um, performing at the West Bridgeford Spiritualist Church in Nottingham. This is October 1956, and um, she there was another police raid, just like at the Master Temple in 1944. And um, she was the police burst in and they switched the lights on. Helen suffered a second degree burn to her to her chest and her belly. And uh, she, she was also put into deep shock. And the police wouldn't take her to hospital. It was, re- it was really horrible. The police wouldn't take her to hospital. They, they arrested, they like detained her. And she was really, really sick. And they said, get her to the hospital, for goodness sake. They wouldn't do it. And Helen, Helen eventually went back home to Edinburgh to recover. But in December of that year, she died. And her death certificate doesn't reveal it. But I think that the police raid actually led to her death. She was never a well woman. She was... She suffered from she was very she was morbidly obese. She had diabetes and things like that. But I think um, she the the shock and the injury she sustained, the burn to her chest and belly, caused her death. 
What do you think the burn actually was, Ben, like in, in psychic terms or physical terms? According to psychics, this does happen sometimes. If you, if you disturb a medium in trance by switching on a light or causing any kind of commotion, sometimes the medium can suffer an injury like this. This is why doors are locked, lights are switched off, down, and the audience is, kept, is told to get very, keep very still. Quiet. I've actually uh, met a medium who's done sort of physical mediumship, and she explained to me that the same sort of thing, that the that, that, that light, physical light, is too much of a, a strong element to um, work with under physical, con- physical sounds conditions. And she said that um, there was a chap in her earlier days of doing this who was, again, a sceptical guy. And I, I don't know if he turned a torch on or put a light on or something, but basically um, she was exposed to normal daylight or, or, or room interior light, interior light. And uh, she said that ectoplasm was coming out of her eye, I think she said, and it whipped back into her eye. Uh, but uh, as it did so, it lashed against her face like a whip mm. and caused like a burn across her face, apparently. She yeah. Said. So uh, it can. Like dangerous stuff in the wrong kind of um, conditions. Yes, and um, this is. The th- th- funny thing is, I actually went to this, this place. I managed to find out where this place in Nottingham was. It's not where the mo- today's Westbridge, West, today's West, Westbridge of Spiritualist Church has its own premises, but it used to operate from a room in a house, and I managed to f- find out where this house was. And I went there, uh, to, to, and I'm, I mean, I managed to film in the Master Temple because I made a couple of videos about this. But when I got to the um, the house, the, the people there they were still very cagey about it. They remembered it. There was some, an old lady there who remembered it, but she wouldn't speak to me, and she she completely refused point blank uh, to let me film in the house. And she even objected to me filming in the street outside. And I, I had to explain to her, you know, it's a public street. I could film here if I want. Oh, they're very. It's still. It's, there's still a shadow cast over this, you know, um, in, in in the spiritualist community in that area for what happened to Helen that day. So, so obviously, once she came out of prison and uh, she was hounded by police, still afterwards, um, you would have thought really that. Uh, I mean, w- w- do you think the authorities were trying to kind of keep on her toes and and just sort of basically hound her? To death is one term, but but hound her out of existence um, because obviously she'd done her penance and stuff, and and the war was then over. Why do you think they were still giving her grief? Well, this is a good question. Why should the authorities care if some of us believe in spiritualism and want to practice spiritualism? And it's um, this this maybe ties in more with the general skeptic thing. I mean, why? It's you could ask questions. Why would they care if we believe in UFOs? Why do they make? Why do they ridicule the idea of UFOs, which um, I, I talked about an awful lot as well? It's it's um, possibly to do with the the way they want us to see the world. They, it's, I think, it's very important for them that we regard the the, the universe in a particular way. The, the common people, so to speak, as they call us, looking down their nose at us, have a particular image of the universe and how it works one of these is we're alone we're we're a tiny little oasis of life in an infinite cosmic desert so that's that that brings in the ufo issue it's one of the reasons why they regard ufos also i think they um they seem to want us to believe that basically there's no such thing as an afterlife unless you believe in the one of the religious views of the afterlife so you're allowed to be an atheist, atheist materialist like Richard Dawkins and say, basically, when you die, that's it. You, you know, you, you, you're gone forever. You just disappear. Or you could believe in God. God, God will judge you and send you to heaven or hell, etc., etc. You can have one of those two options, but there's no third position permitted. Spiritualism offers a third position. And I think this is, this is obviously a third position that the government don't want us to have. I, mm, now this this very much leads into the whole kind of like Illuminati, Illuminati control structure in terms of keeping the masses dumbed down and stupid and watching, you know, soap operas and things and not focusing on what is the government really doing and what is life really all about. Yeah. Well, it's always an argument I've said is that if, if you can assassinate people and governments do, you know, using other countries' henchmen to assassinate them, kind of keep them uh, separated from, from the nasty business they want to do undercover... Um, uh, but people like Helen Duncan and more modern mediums, uh, physical mediums, can bring these people back. Uh, uh, you know, for instance, imagine if you've got a physical medium who brought back Princess Diana 
into a seance room and she walked around and shook hands with people and and claimed that she was murdered by xyz people that would be a very awkward position for whoever uh has authorized her death um to be exposed to very awkward (laughs) yeah you can you can see why the the things like on tv uh, the announcements, uh, you know, when you when you've got a demonstration of mediumship saying it's only for entertainment purposes only, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and yet when you're watching a, a religious program, there's always a kind of never any announcement prior to that to say, you know, uh, this Jesus stuff is just for entertainment purposes only, and yet you know, r- spiritualism, it, by law, is a legitimate religion, and so yeah. when you've got a person who's a medium like your your you know, uh, Tony Stockwell's or someone like that demonstrating on a platform on a TV show. Um, they should be given a free reign to express it how they want to, rather than um, have this kind of disclaimer at the beginning or at the end of the program. Yeah, it's some um, funny thing is, I mean, it's they they don't do what they used to do. I mean, now I think I've never ever heard of police raiding a spiritualist church. How they how they have they like the gatekeepers. Uh, the, the the Professor Brian Coxes, the Richard Dawkinses, the James Randys, they have the sceptics, who in a sense do that job for them. So you don't need to pass laws, you don't need to force people when you can actually bring people who will, knowingly or not, confuse and um, distort and mislead. With with gatekeepers, obviously, like Brian Cox and people like that, misleading us, I think... Um Perhaps if we're in a time of, of a world war where things are a little bit more heated as such uh, and you've got your physical mediums bringing back people from sunken battleships or aircraft crashes or wherever it may be, that's potentially where you could see a repeat of a Helen Duncan type of trial. But I'd imagine it probably wouldn't be done as a trial if it was today's world. They might do a much more underhand thing and get rid of them in some way. What do you think to that, Ben? Well, there's a part of me that's actually quite glad that Helen was um, in prison, because I think if if the prosecution case had fallen apart, um, she, she they, they may well have killed her. They may well have simply killed her. I mean, there's, um, there's uh, a situation where something similar happened in Alaska a few years ago. It was actually some um, gangsters who tried to kill a psychic medium because she was helping the police. Um, now, I, from their point of view, in a sense, I can I can sympathise in a, in a sense, but then at the same time, I'd like to ask uh, the government why didn't they simply pay her off? I mean, Helen Helen was a patriotic woman; she was behind the war effort, like most people were in those days. All they had to do was get her to sign the Official Secrets Act and just say they didn't have to tell her why. They just said, "Look, we want you just to stop practicing for a few months, just until just for a few months, okay? Um, we'll tell you when you can start again." Um, here's some money to, to compensate you for your loss of earnings, and just that's it. it or would, it or would, even better than that, come and work for us. Well, ex- so. well, if, if if she'd been in Germany at the time, uh, she'd have been working for the SS. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, honestly, it's that's all they had to do, and she, it would cost. It would probably be more. She, it could pay her more than what she was earning anyway, and it would cost. It would have cost less than the trial. So I mean, it's to me, it is obsolete tomfoolery, as Winston Churchill put it. Mm. I think I think really at the end of the day the government made fools of themselves really uh, mm. and exposed their own kind of um, misdemeanors as such. Anyway, we'd like to say thank you very much uh, to Ben Emlyn Jones for part one of this uh, program talking about um, medium Helen Duncan and uh, the things that happened to her during World War Two. And join us in a few moments after the break for part two where we'll be discussing. <coughs> Uh, more interesting theories and scepticisms in the Paranormal Peep Show with myself and Andrew Chaplin. See you in a bit, guys. The work of medium Philip Kinsella. The reading that I had by Philip this evening was spot on. I feel it's important for those people who are waiting for their message from their loved ones to show how they passed over and what part they played in that person's life. The spirit will then probably talk about the person that they're coming through, about their life and about what they're worried about, what their concerns are. Normally a spirit will remember how they passed over, but sometimes it's not always the case. Some, sometimes a spirit will pass over very tragically, very violently, and they're left in confusion. So all I will get is a jumble of confused memories. What was, was she spying on someone next door? <laughs> Always looking out the window. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't get the problem. 
of spirits um, sending in me into three people at one time. I may have what I call a queue jump that will come in, but I will notice that as I'm reading for a particular person in the audience, there's someone else knocking on the door basically and wanting to come in. So once I finish my reading, I will then go to that person at all. And sometimes it's difficult because when you get a queue jump or someone from the other side that seems to jump the queue, you've got to find your link with that person. Normally I go directly to an individual and read for them. Other times someone will come on um, and through to your consciousness and throw you slightly. Yeah, okay. he was spot on with everything he said. Brilliant. There wasn't one thing he didn't say that wasn't true. To find out more about the psychic work of Philip Kinsella, visit philip-kinsella.co.uk. That's philip-kinsella.co.uk. Hello, welcome back to the Paranormal Peep Show with myself, Neil Geddesward, and Andy Chaplin. And if you listen to the first part of the show, thanks, Andy. If you listen to the first part of the show, we were talking to our guest, Ben Emlyn Jones, on the psychic medium, Helen Duncan, a wartime medium who was prosecuted under the Witchcraft Act. And uh, Ben, before we leave the subject of Helen Duncan, if you could just uh, give us the latest information that might be of interest to people who want to find out more about her, uh, if there's a website, for instance, but also um, we understand there's some more of a kind of legal challenge to the case that was brought against her. Is that right? That's right. I mean, there's an organisation um, which is a campaign to pardon Helen Duncan, which is run by Margaret Hahn, who is Helen's granddaughter, who has a, become a friend of mine. And you can find out details at www.helenduncan.org.uk. Now, this campaign has been going on for a long time. In, in, one form or no, in one form or another, it really dates back to when she first came out of jail in 1944. Uh, but it's not had much luck recently. That They wanted to basically get her pardoned and get her conviction overturned and an apology from the government for what they did. Um, which is the government has not been forthcoming. But there's been a new breakthrough, and it all, turn, it all comes around to a common law precedent which has been known as Turing's Law. Now, this, this is actually going through Parliament as a statute as well. But in 2013, the government pardoned Alan Turing. Now, Alan Turing is well known for being a very famous electronics wizard. He's a pioneer of artificial intelligence and computers. And um, he actually designed a computer called Enigma. Uh, sorry, a computer that could crack the famous Enigma encryption system that was used by Nazi Germany in World War II, the supposedly unbreakable code. This is a guy who should have been treated as one of Britain's greatest war heroes, but um, he was actually jailed for gross indecency under the Le Bruchere Amendment. Now, this basically means he was, he was doing something which today is totally acceptable and even trendy. He was an out-of-the-closet homosexual. Now, um, he was treated very badly, actually. He was uh, given medical procedures to turn him straight, which actually ruined his physical and mental health. And in 1954, he committed suicide. Now, in 13 years after that, in 1967, the Le Bruchere Amendment was repealed in the same way that in 1951, the 1735 Witchcraft Act was repealed, which meant basically that what was considered a crime at the time Turing was, was convicted was no longer an offence. Now, um, he's one of many, many people, actually. Well, he's, some of them are still alive, but others are campaigning for those who died. But um, there's a large number of people now campaigning for um, a, official pardons under the repeal of these archaic sodomy laws, as they were called. Now, um, the government has been very forthcoming. They, they apologized to Turing in 2008, and they officially pardoned him in 2013. But this means... <clears throat> This, could, this sets a very, very important legal precedent, and this is going to be a statute, like I say, Turing's law, is going to become real. But the passing of the Witchcraft Act by Parliament is considered to be one of these Enlightenment thinking processes, but of course it was an archaic law at the time that Helen was convicted, and not long after her conviction, it was repealed. So, basically what they're saying now is, there's um, the, the Graham Hewitt, who's a man I um, hope to talk to pretty soon, He's a friend of Maggie's, and he says, The Turing Law has set a precedent for Helen's pardon to come, and it is one her family will welcome. The circumstances are almost identical. Like Alan Turing, Helen was convicted under legislation now long repealed. There is a precedent, and we are willing, we are writing to the Scottish government demanding that they do the same. So it's been a long time for justice for Helen Duncan, but it's coming soon. 
I think <laughs> Helen Dunkett is going to be pardoned. And apparently she's in the spirit world right now, in regular contact with her family, so no doubt this will be welcome news to her. <laughs> That's quite an interesting scenario, actually. It's welcome news to me. Do you think when she's in the spirit world right now, she'd actually really worry about it because she's got a completely new kind of phase of life? Apparently she's very supportive of this campaign. Ah, I suppose from her point of view, wherever she may be in the spirit world or wherever you want to think of that place to be, um, maybe she sees it as a way of kind of actually helping other mediums uh, in this present time and space that uh, might come under some sort of uh, prosecution issues and police issues. Yeah, and this is the thing, and this would hopefully... It might. I mean, who knows where this could go? It could get. It could go to a reopening of the publicity surrounding Helen's case, and maybe an, an awareness of, the, of some of the things that I've been trying to talk about, like Maggie, Maggie Hahn, her granddaughter, has been trying to talk about and trying to make publicly aware. Now, if if there, was there a conference or something? I understand there was a planned conference or something. Was it last year or was it? Well, uh... there was a Helen Duncan convention in 2014, which I was a speaker at. Um, there's been nothing since, but I did attend a conference a couple of months ago called the ASAPS, that's the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena, the ASAP Seriously Suspicious Conference in London. It was at the Goldsmith College, Lon Goldsmiths College London, and I attended that, and I spoke about some Helen Duncan there. And how was that received? Very well indeed. I mean, it was a, it was a challenging audience because they were kind of like half, half of them are sceptics, you know. But well, 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 Goldsmiths is, is where um, Chris French, of course, is, um, I think, um, head of psychology. <laughs> yes, he was one of the organisers of the event and uh, he's, yeah. a very, he's a very likeable chap and we got on very well. And that, um, that's, that's very, very, very surprising to me, Ben, because um, I, I, I don't dislike um, Chris French. You know, I, you know, I haven't got any bad feelings towards him, but he does come across as very hardcore almost kind of dawkins cox hardcore and i'm very surprised that your energy is kind of like um get on can you explain why that might be ben probably because i've spent a lot of time with skeptics over the since i became a crazy nutcase whatever they would <laughs> i've actually been looking I'm, I'm, I'm looking i've been looking at both sides of the story and i do like to do this i like to look at both sides of every issue mm. and so i've actually spent a lot of time with skeptics over the last few years i'm a member of oxford skeptics in a pub I regularly attend their events. I sometimes travel to London and other places to attend other Skeptics in the Pub event. I attended the TAM London, <coughs> a major Skeptic conference in 2010. Um, and um, I've known Professor French for a while. Um, I get on well with him. And, and we, 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 I, we, I think we had more contact during this conference than before. And um, Skeptics, as I said, they are, some of them can be really quite unpleasant. Um, mm. And I've had some run-ins with some really nasty ones. So um, the ones that are, that are actually are um, civil towards me, I'm, I'm, I warm to. You know, I don't have a problem with them if they think differently to me. That's fine with me, as long mm. as they're civil to me. F Professor Chris French is actually quite a civil chap, and I do. He is very hardcore. I mean, he's one of the. He used to edit Skeptic magazine. He's one of the world's. He's one of the world's principal skeptics, actually, and he's mm. retired now, and he's. Sort of handed over the reins to his young apprentice, uh, <laughs> uh, who's called Rob Brotherton, <laughs> and I'm expecting to hear more from him in the coming years. But um, he's uh, he's a likable fella. He's a good good guy. And and obviously in your work with with obviously you you, you go to paranormal conferences. You've got your own paranormal uh, radio show uh, and things, and you talk to lots of different people. Um, you you kind of uh, you, you do a really good presentation, uh, which I was listening to. Uh, recently, in fact, you had a chat with your friend Colin, who's your chief kind of sceptic on your your Hipanwa radio yeah. uh, discussion. Colin, um, forget his surname. Colin Snugs, yeah. yeah. He was on Hipanwa TV. I did a little video with him, yeah. That's right, yeah. You had a kind of a, a sceptics debate with him, didn't you? And um, yeah. he's also commented on some of my videos, uh, I think, which you presented, actually, um, to do with UFOs and things like that. And, um, uh, I mean... <laughs> It's an interesting. They they ask interesting questions, but uh, you obviously have a, a way of trying to explain to it. Do, do they kind of just shut shut down and just don't want to listen to your explanation? Is is there a psychology to the skeptic where uh, they they just don't want to hear the answers that might actually solve their problems? It could be. I mean, it's, to to begin with, skeptics are. This is the uh, this is something I've been looking into. I've done an entire presentation on this, which you've watched as well. I know. Um, Skeptics are um, a phenomena. The skeptic movement is a phenomena. It's quite recent. I mean, you trace it back. There were a few individuals who you could call skeptics from 
the past past years, but really it's a product of the 20th century. Um, and um, they are people who well describe themselves. I mean, the uh, this is how they describe themselves. Themselves, a skeptic is one who rigorously and openly applies the methods of science and reason to all empirical claims. A skeptic provisionally proportions acceptance of any claims to valid logic and fair and thorough assessment of available evidence and studies the pitfalls of human reason and the mechanism of de mechanisms of deception so as to avoid being deceived by others or themselves. Now that is how a skeptic describes themselves, but is that a description or is it a slogan? I wonder <laughs> if that's actually accurate. Mm. So it sounds like, sounds like they're failing to actually adhere to that kind of ruling because they kind of maybe don't know their own rules of the game, perhaps. Well, we've already discussed, we've already talked about that, about how, um, you know, the sceptic will say things like, we need a rational explanation for that, and, well, is there a non-paranormal thing we can come up with first? Can we come up with a non-paranormal explanation for this? And so you say, well, let me think of one, and you just conjure up anything non-paranormal that's physically possible, and they can say, right, well, we really ought to consider this possibility before we consider any UFO-related possibilities, shouldn't we? Because it's non-paranormal. Mm. And um, that is it's, one of the it's, many it's almost like by, It's almost like they're, they're kind of saying the default position is, well, of course it can't be paranormal, so there's got to be some other reason. It's almost yeah. like they cannot ever accept that there, there's a possibility that it could be paranormal. Well, they consider, <sighs> yeah, they, they consider, you see, they, their vision of themselves, I think, is actually false. Mm. I think it's not like what it appears to be. It's not... But when I look at them, and I've studied them from outside, not many people have done this from our side of the argument. Very few. Mm. Um, they've actually studied the sceptic movement from the position of being a tinfoil hat-wearing, believing, loony, and whatever, you see. Whatever mm. they call us. And um, I've, I think that they actually are self-deluded. They're a culture... Mm. They're a very um, inwardly inward-looking culture that has... Um, that is not seeing their own their own f false falsehoods. You see, they don't mm. really have an awareness of their own falsehoods. And in fact, I think that I think they have a phrase actually that they that they use for us that actually applies to them, and that phrase is confirmation bias. They say yeah. of psychics, "Well, we go to a ghost hunt and we tune into spirit, and that knock on the wind." though that tap on the door you know you're confirming your own bias that there are spirits out there i would knock that ball straight back in their court and say well they're going on ghost hunting to skeptics and parapsychologists trying to debunk it and they're trying to confirm to themselves that there's a rational explanation and it's just a load of old rubbish yeah. that, that, that they're, they're looking specifically for um rational explanations which okay i can understand but there it seems to be that a lot of skeptics i've come across because i have kind of um, brushes with them myself as well because I don't know if you know it or not um, Ben but I kind of do clairvoyant events and ghost hunts and demos and stuff myself so I've sort of like brushed shoulders with them and um, I've, I've, again I've come across some cynical ones and nasty ones but I've also come across ones that are civil and the ones that are civil I actually find quite interesting I find it quite interesting to kind of get their point of view on things and it's almost like they're going out with a view to confirm to themselves that it's all rubbish and to confirm to themselves that it's of course it's plumbing it's dodgy plumbing it's dodgy electrics it's just wind blowing the door and almost kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. in, in my yeah opinion. and they have a reasoning system in which they can almost it's it's almost like whatever evidence is presented before them they mm. have an internal reasoning system that allows them to dismiss it. They don't realize this. They'll say, we're only looking for the evidence. All we want is mm. the evidence. The evidence is not there. But you say, well, here's, there's several I mean, there's several different methods they use uh, that they use, in many cases, honestly. I think they, they, they do it in sincerity. It's, it's almost yeah. sense, it's, it's, a, it's basically bad logic. Um, I, 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 I believe... I, I thought, sorry, yeah. I was going to say, I believe that at a higher level, a skeptic movement is actually controlled by what you might want to call uh, psychological warfare organisations. I mean, they've got, mm. there's distinct evidence for this. However, I, I think, um, so carry on. So, so, I was just going to say, like, um, what you're saying there, it's almost like they've got fallback positions. So let's say something kind of very abnormal and kind of like paranormally, supernaturally happens in front of them. They will always have a, um, a fallback position. Oh, well, it can't be that. So it's got to be this. And then you might be able to disprove them on that. And then they'll have another position. Well, OK, but we've got to look at this as well and that as well and that as well. And they'll keep going back and back and back and back. And there's, there's, there's always kind of like a twist in a corner that they can turn to 
to come back with something well it can't be paranormal it has to be something else um but that something else can be a multiple um array of things yeah i mean a perfect example is the rendlesham forest incident which we've already mm. discussed they're coming up with the most abs- outrageous um explanations for it now i mean there's um there's the the lighthouse theory um and there's also someone said oh there was a truckload of burning manure <laughs> in the vicinity that these highly trained um, um air force uh, security security uh, specialists mistook for a, an alien spacecraft um, <laughs> what a pile of manure that is <laughs> Well, it's been put down to satellites, and, and supposedly the, someone's got evidence to suggest the satellite did re-enter the Earth's atmosphere on that night, or one of the nights mm-hmm. concerned of uh, the Reynoldsham case. But, um... Or a helicopter. Uh, one of my favourites is the joyriding ice cream van. Um, <laughs> oh, apparently, <laughs> Yes. And some, uh, yeah, so apparently some local, uh, some local uh, thugs broke into some guy's house, and he, apparently he's, the, he's a local ice cream vendor. In the winter, of course, they, he, he wasn't working, but he worked in the summer selling ice cream in Woodbridge, and um, they stole his ice cream van and went on a joyride with it, and they drove it around Cable Green with the uh, lights and the, the, the uh, music playing and the, the jingles and things like that, and that's what the, these guys saw. These are very highly intelligent and highly trained Air Force officers. Now, so um, where- it's funny well, you get your ice creams left at East Gate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop me and buy one at East Gate. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? It's absurd. But I mean, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about because, of course, if, if, um, imagine Randallson Forest had been very, very different. In other words, if some guy's walking his dog in the woods, comes across the alien spacecraft. Right, what would the skeptics say? They would say, well, how come no one at the base saw it? Hmm. How come, why didn't they send the guards out with the security, uh, the security police out to check it out? How come they didn't, um, you know, walk, walk, walk around the woods taking uh, audio recordings and radiation readings and things like that? If they'd done that, I would believe you. But until then, there's just not enough evidence. Mm. And what have I just described? I've just described a situation which they raised the bar. Because all those things that I've just described did happen at Rendlesham Forest, yet still the skeptics demand more. Yeah, yeah. This they, is their it. first evidence is unquenchable when it comes to things like this. Alternatively, I mean, they will they will accept a um, a non paranormal explanation with with, with almost no um, almost no uh, scrutiny at all. And I'll give you a good example of that. Um, skeptics call themselves they they just they regard themselves as the ultimate purveyors of reason and logic. But um, do you know? Have you heard of psychic Sally Morgan? Yes. yes. Yeah, I've yeah. seen her. Seen her live in Weymouth. She yep, gave she, me a reading. Oh, good. Yes, yeah, she's she's great. She she appeared in Dublin um, at a theatre doing one of her live shows, as she does. And um, somebody reported to the local media that um, she, they heard a voice backstage that was given details that they heard a voice saying these details, and Sally was repeating them. Okay. Now, this for the skeptics, this harkened back to one of the biggest skeptic coups of all time, which, to be fair, was a was a was a good call. James Randi exposed the uh, evangelical preacher P- Peter Popoff, and he discovered that Peter Popoff was uh, using a radio earpiece, and he was getting uh, basically hot reading. He was he was getting secret information from his uh, wife, who was re- who was reading out um, it, basically information about the people he was getting information on, which he su- said came from angels and from God, um, and transmitting it to this earpiece in his ear. Now. In this case, James Randi sent someone in with a scanner and picked up the actual rec- the transmission and recorded it. Okay. So the skeptics, as soon as the skeptics heard what was, like, Sally was doing, they said, well, it's obvious she's doing the same thing. She's got a radio earpiece in her ear, and someone backstage is, is sending her, uh, see, sending her um, information. That's how she knows all this stuff which she says she gets psychically. She doesn't. She gets it from somebody just talking into a microphone and she's getting it from her radio earpiece. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. 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 Now the problem, the, this was, um, the problem is the, uh, as soon as this got out into the media, this hearsay was magically transformed into solid fact in the minds of the skeptics. Um, they didn't do what James Randi did. They didn't send in anyone with any scanning equipment. Uh, they got no, they, so they basically, they, Someone called Paul Zenon, who's a well-known skeptic, he, he wrote in, his, in the column in the Daily Mail that this is what Psychic Sally was doing. She was basically pulling a pop-off. And um, the skeptic, of course, being the ultimate purveyors of evidence, knew this immediately, even though they hadn't gathered. Um, and Sally um, 
was well, Sally actually received a lot of death threats and things like that from various people. She had um, most obscene, threatened with the most obscene violence. She was called every name under the sun. Um, and um, she sued the Daily Mail for, and got £185,000 in damages plus costs. Very richly deserved. And the skeptics didn't even respond to this. They didn't even realize what a massive blunder they'd made. They sort of flailed around, just make it was hardly mentioned. There was a couple of a couple of them made excuses on the skeptic forum, but basically they just went quiet about the whole thing. But this was a monumental monumental cock up on the up on the part of the skeptics. Because they had accused someone without any evidence at all of doing something because they just thought um and I actually got into a discussion with a skeptic about this and I said, Well he said, Well, which is more likely? Is she um getting information from from the spirit world or is someone transmitting it through her earpiece and um, I said well are you going to take that to court so the skeptics actually have no idea what real evidence is they have no idea how to apply it they fool themselves into thinking they do and they get so overconfident because of this this internal delusion that they have that they <coughs> they, they carry out these ridiculous utter flamingos like, like they did with, with uh, Sally Morgan. With, with Sally Morgan, having the fact that I've seen her, I can perhaps offer some kind of interesting observations of her show. Uh, I yeah. saw her in Weymouth, and um, I've also seen uh, Derek Acora in Weymouth at the Weymouth Pavilion, uh, maybe about a year prior. And I have to say the difference between the two... Uh, it was quite astounding, um, and I'm not saying that Sally Morgan was the best medium I've ever seen. Um, she wasn't. She she was good, but she certainly wasn't the best I've seen. But uh, Derek Acora, I'd have to say, and I'll, I'm quite happy to say this in public, in my opinion, he was the worst medium I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so if, if, if he was a total fake in the sense of uh, using the same technique, you would have thought he would have got it a lot better. You know, you thought his radio transmitter and receiver system would have been working hands down and he would have been given brilliant readings. But in fact, it, it was embarrassing to watch, I'd have to say. You know, he, he wasted half the show moving his little table around on the stage and wiping his brow of all the sweat, probably because he was not sure how, how the show was going to go. I don't know. But he was covered out with names and no one could take the names. And he actually physically walked down the steps of the stage into the audience to see if anyone was going to take the name. And you could almost see desperation in the sweat of his brow um, because no one could accept the names. And... The, he he fell back unfortunately on on what mediums always do when they're not not getting a very good reception uh and and it's uh, maybe it's a technique i mean i guess me and andy have seen it maybe uh, quite a lot uh, in our own kind of study of this thing because we've kind of trained in this area a little bit as well mm. um as that at uh he would always say, well, I've got your grandmother here, love, and she offers you love and, and she's offering you flowers. And the other technique that he was doing was saying that um, uh, I've got your grandmother here, love. And she says that when you leave tonight in the car, listen out for a noise on your dashboard of the car because she's going to make a knocking sound. And of course, there's no way of knowing whether this girl... Uh, when she drives home that evening, we'll hear a knocking sound from her grandmother. And the trouble is, even if there is a knocking sound on her dashboard, you can't, as uh, skeptics would quite rightly say, you can't rule it out to be a noise in the car anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's not the best place for grandmother to make contact, is the noise of a rattling car, really. Yeah. Um, a quiet bedroom would be a much more serene place to do it, I'd imagine, a much more objective place to do it. But Derek Acora was, was the worst. Um, but if they were all using a cold body language reading then mm. Derek Hall was failing miserably at it I just think he's he's he may have some limited psychic ability but he certainly was not Britain's best uh, medium as he claims to be uh, I, I, I have to say stuff. I have to say um, when he first started out I quite liked him and I think there was something like genuine with him because he was on predictions um, with Sky TV uh, probably about circa 1999 uh, before he did Most Haunted and all that kind of thing <clears throat> I went to see him twice um, one in Hemel Hempstead and one in Apollo um, I think it was Apollo um, at the London one I, he was actually quite good the Hemel one he wasn't quite so good um, but I will say from my personal experience of doing demos myself as well 
you will always get good nights and bad nights and I've experienced that myself I mean my worst was in Boxford and I'd arrived there late should have seen that one coming arrived there late because of huge traffic on the um, M11 and um, I was all flustered somebody else had to cover for me I kind of got there halfway um, and because I was so stressed I just literally got nothing right at all um, however other occasions I've done demos where the the accuracy has even astounded me where I, I like it when even I am kind of like um, are taken aback with some of the stuff um, that comes through, which I don't credit myself for. I credit like Spirit um, for doing that, but I've had that as well. So I would say kind of in Derek's defence, although I think he's kind of gone down the theatrical route in, in the recent kind of uh, Most Haunted episodes, I think to begin with he was hit and miss, but then I think a lot of mediums are hit and miss. What do you think, Neil? Um, yeah, and, and as you say, and, and Ben's obviously got some experiences of going to spiritualist shows, haven't you, Ben? Um, you've obviously seen, yeah. seen good good performances by mediums and, and bad performances, and sometimes you go and see a, what you hope to be a really good demonstration by your favourite medium, and they're just mm. not as good as they were like you know last summer or something. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, having said that, I've seen some mediums that are average, and I've seen some mediums that are really really good. And the trouble is that I mean, we went to the spiritualist church here in Weymouth the uh, on Sunday evening just gone and uh, you kind of wish why did I bother because it was really boring and just pretty pretty averagely boring in, in fact and yeah. and that's the problem with spiritualist churches they're putting people out on platform that are just not ready for it or even trained properly for it what mm, do you think yeah well sometimes um, the skeptics do get it right sometimes I mean they, I mentioned Peter Popoff that was definitely a legitimate coup on the part of the skeptics and it was a legitimate bust on a man who was fake totally fake Mm. Um, um, the, the they do and Jericho Cora he, he was he's been caught out a few times by the skeptics. I mean, if you Google Creed Kafer, oh uh, God, yes, K R W E D K A F E R, just Google that and you'll see they basically fed him a, a yarn secretly to see if he'd take the bait, and he did. Creed Kafer supposedly a South African prison warder <laughs> who died. Land <laughs> <laughs> Coros, he went to South Africa and he's, he was supposedly channeling this dead South African prison water. Turns out it was a fake story that they planted to see if he'd go for it and he did. So um... I, Yeah, and I believe it was Kieran O'Keefe who set him up and um, Creed Kafer is actually an, um, what do you call it? An anagram. An anagram, anagram of Derek Faker and yeah. what they did is they wrote it on a piece of paper put it on the floor, see he, if he would pick up on it and also told some of the production staff, staff to kind of um, whisper it slightly out of earshot but just so he can just pick up on it and sure enough we got Creed Kafer Creed Kafer <laughs> Thank you Sam, what's that again? Creed Kafer <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. so the yeah. guy, I mean, whether he's real or not, I mean, he, he may have some real talent, but he's obviously, he's, the problem is that even real performers will sometimes be tempted to fake just to, just to keep mm. up their performance. I mean, um, I, this, this happens on exact, paranormal shows. I think that's par- exactly right, Ben. Yeah, I think that. I, I think paranormal that, shows. Yeah. Yeah this, yeah, this counts for paranormal TV. I mean, I know a guy. He's a he's a top. He's a producer. He produ- he's produced um, several TV shows. He starred in a couple of TV shows, and um, he uh, was offered um, a, he was offered a chance to do another program for one of the big networks. He was offered um, a big. He was offered a, a team of staff. He was offered a big budget, and they said, um, "Yeah, we want you to do a, a ghost investigation series. You know, ha- ha- visit haunted houses, stuff like this. It'll be one of the top shows around." And he said. Cool, that's great. Just one thing, though, uh, we're going to have to um, fake a couple of things if you don't get the results you need. We we do need to be able to have at least in every episode at least one paranormal thing. So if you can't find anything real, we will have to fake some stuff. And this guy, to his credit, his name's Ross Hemsworth. He's um, a good friend of mine. To his credit, he got up and he walked out, mm. and he refused to have anything to do with it. But yeah. some of them won't. You see, some of them will take. They, they will do that deal with the devil, and mm. they will. Uh, they will take that. Uh, they will go for it. You know. As I say, if you, if you watched, um, uh, probably won't be able to see them. But um, predictions in the nineteen nineties, uh, nineteen ninety nine, very very early for Derek's career. I think he was actually all right. He was, and he did. He didn't have kind of like the theatrics. I think most haunted went on and on and on. And I think you know how it is with the shows. The next series has got to be bigger. It's got to be better. You know that kind of American thing of making big and bold and you know better than everything else. And and like I think Derek got caught up in the theatrics. It started off with just a ghost investigation, and it turned into kind of like it turned into pantomime at the end of it, in my opinion. I, th- I think um, 
again, going back to the one I saw at Weymouth of Derek Akora, um, you know, he makes his statement on his website that he's Britain's best medium, always continually filling out theatres. But when I got to this theatre, I mean, I did question why I was there, but the ticket was bought for me. So I thought, well, I'll go along, try and give him the benefit of the doubt, because obviously I'd heard about these various accusations and controversies to do with the programs he's been involved with and being caught out but i thought okay my brother thought he had got a pretty good reading of him once in the theater i'll, I'll give it a go as the ticket's been bought for me i'll go but there wasn't even half an audience there which was quite embarrassing mm. and then during the first yeah. half it was really really bad and then during the break we all went out and there was like a silence in the audience as we all shuffled out thinking is that mm. it and then, <laughs> then at the very end of the show we all shuffled out again and everyone was inside and there was no excitement, mm. no talking about it. Like you would, if you'd just be really impressed by someone, mm. it was just like thinking, what have we just paid for kind of feeling. Now, Neil, when you went to see Sally Morgan, um, I'm all right in thinking she came to you and gave you a reading. Yeah. What happens? Uh, she's on stage. It was the same theatre. And this time it was pretty, I wouldn't say maximum to the brim, but it was pretty much fuller than, than Derek Okora was. And they have uh, a guy on stage with a video camera and there's a big screen behind her so that basically when she's given a reading for someone, um, so that people can see who she's given a reading to, the guy on stage with a video camera will zoom in and someone hands you a microphone so you can be heard of the PA system and uh, you can see yourself on the big screen, which is just fantastic. And um, it's uh, basically you start to obviously say yes or no according to what she's given you, yeah. Mm. And, and what, was she accurate? What, did she nail things on the head for you? Um, now I'm trying to remember how she came to me. She started to talk about um, someone called Brian and a Mary. And she says, can anyone take Mary connected with a Brian? Now, I personally don't have that in my family, but my daughter's boyfriend, um, his mother was called Mary, and she died about two years ago, and her husband's called Brian. And that kind of rang a bell with me. So basically, I said, yeah, I think I can possibly take that. So mm. I had to stand up, given a microphone. There I was on the big screen. And they spoke about something, and I can't remember exactly what information was about socks on a radiator or something like that, that he doesn't wash, he takes mm. his socks off. Instead of putting them in the wash, he just sticks them on the radiator and it's all sweaty to dry. And it, it caused a bit of a laugh with the audience. Now... I couldn't vouch whether that was true or false. That piece of information, I just said I'll have to check on that. Mm. Um, but And I can't really remember the rest of the reading. So it was a little bit hit and miss, I have to say. You know, it might have been valid for me. I did pass the information back to my daughter's boyfriend, who is a sceptic. Mm. So he was a bit um and ah and about the whole thing. Um, so it was not conclusive, I have to say. But uh, Go on. No, 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 Kevin. But I have, therefore, other, seen other mediums, uh, and there's a guy, I'll mention his name, quite happy to mention names, um, Ross Bartlett. He's a young medium from the Southampton area. I would say he's about 23 now, roughly. Uh, apologies if I got that wrong. Um, as of uh, January 2017, roughly, he's about that age. And I'd heard whispers around the town, as it were, you must go and see this guy. And my girlfriend had seen him first of all. Uh, and then we managed to catch up with him when he came and did a demonstration in Rice Slip. And um, a guy who I was in a development circle with, um, Gary White, you may know Gary, uh, possibly. Mm. Yeah. Um, I kept telling Gary, you've got to get this guy up in, in your area because he really is good. And eventually he came to the Rice Slip area, which is in uh, Middlesex. And my girlfriend and I, we managed to sort of get tickets, although the tickets were got for me by Gary. And the idea was that I was going to pay Gary there on the night and I was just going to pick up the tickets at the door. This is where it gets kind of freaky because I'd really love a skeptic to explain this. OK, and I'll just relate that story as quick <laughs> as I can for everybody. Um, basically, we arrived there a little bit late because we had trouble trying to find the right building because there's three or four buildings. They all look the same. We had to go to every single building to find out which one it was. And we finally got the right one. And we went in. The door was open. There was a guy in a white shirt at the table. And he said, just go and sit over there in the corner. So we went in and everyone's already there. It's already started. So you think, oh, God, we're late. So we shuffled down quietly as we could. And we ha happened to sit sort of like sideways to where the medium uh, was doing his demonstration. And anyway, I had my digital recorder there with me. So, you know, if anyone wants to listen to this recording or you want me to play it at some point, I can't obviously do it in tonight's show because it's not prepared, but I can play that on a later show if necessary. Um, and basically, 
after about the first reading, he suddenly looked to me and he said, I want to come to the gentleman on my left. And he looked across at me. So I said, oh, hello there. So I started recording my digital recorder. And he said, I've got the name of um, Evie or Evis or something like that. And I said, mm, sorry, I don't know that name. So I was thinking, I ain't got it. I think you've got the wrong person. And he said, um, Eve, Evie, who's connected, uh, your brother knows about her because um, he's researched into her grave, your brother Phil. And as soon as he said the word Phil, I thought, I do have a brother called Phil, and my <laughs> brother does go around photographing family gravestones. So I thought, well, this is now making a sort of sense, but I couldn't take the relative. But she's, he said, she's your auntie who's married to Edward. And I thought, I'm sorry, I haven't got an auntie called Evis who's married to Edward. Um so it didn't make any sense, but as I say, the brother Phil bit did. So I thought, there's something going on here. Let's just carry it on sort of thing. But then he said, um, she's talking about Morgan. I said, yes, that's my daughter. So I thought, that's the second hit there. That's quite good. She's getting very good, in fact. And uh, she said, you know, she calls in on Morgan because she likes to see how she's doing. Now, he paused for a minute and he was in doubt about himself. You could see the doubt that he was having about what he was getting through, thinking, should he say this or not? And he was kind of nodding to someone you couldn't see, like a spirit or whatever. And he said, OK, I'll go for it. He said, now, do you see the gentleman over there in the corner? And he pointed to the guy with a white shirt who waved us through the door, the guy on the table. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, that guy over there is called Mr. Chris Hayes. And as soon as he said that, I thought, oh, my God, I know what's coming. He said, Evie is saying that Chris Hayes, the name Chris Hayes, is also connected with Morgan that you know. And I said, absolutely bang on right. I said, my daughter Morgan, who is 21 at the time, is going out with a gentleman also by the name of Chris Hayes. That's a bit and weird. <laughs> that was incredibly weird. Strange coincidences, if you want to call them that, but just too freaky for words, because not only has he got the full name right, he's also got the fact that there's two Chris Hayeses, and he's connected this one with my Chris Hayes. Um, you know, And people say, oh, but he knew where you was going to sit, but we arrived late, and the tickets weren't in our name, things like that, you know. So... Mm. I'd like the sceptics to explain that. And also the other thing, the fact that I couldn't get the name of the relative right. Well, I went back to my mum, maybe a day or two later, to say, who, who is Evie? And she goes, I don't know. So she started to ask in my family about it. She ended up speaking to my dad's sister over the telephone. And she goes, oh, I know who she is. She is Auntie Doris. But she never used her first name because she didn't like it. Like it. So she always used her middle name, which was Doris. So in fact, Evie was her first name by default, but she always used the name Doris, and she happened to be married to what we knew as Uncle Ted, i.e. Edward, <laughs> which was the Edward mentioned at the very beginning of the reading that I couldn't understand, you see. So all the dots connected perfectly from my yeah. position. So there we go. That's what I consider a very, very good reading. And and that also knocks out of the water cold reading because uh, people say, oh, well, they, you know, obviously kind of like they're, they're reading it off the person in the audience. They're, you know, body language or whatever, or I don't know how they do the cold reading thing, but that's what they're doing because you didn't know that information at the time and you that was not even in your mind. So it couldn't have been plucked out of your mind if it's not in your mind. That's right. And then there's also the claim that people get it off Facebook or they get it off Google and things like mm. that. And, and You can't with that. You can't. Well, yeah. My, my auntie died well before the internet was ever on the scene uh, and so did her husband, Ted. And um, and as I say, it was my belief that she was always called Doris, never mm. Evie, I'd never even heard of the name Evie. So it, it just didn't make any sense to me, you see. So uh, and then for them to get the information to connect my daughter's boyfriend with the fact that the guy in the corner was happened to have the same name and mm. they used him. So they must have like planted the image of this guy in in um, Ross Bartlett's mind to say, use this guy as a name and in fact that yeah. happens with me and it probably happens with you is that when you're um having to give a name out to the audience you're sometimes often shown uh, a name of someone you know that's it because yeah. that's the same name as the person uh, in the audience yeah. knows for instance I when my that. daughter started going out with her boyfriend 
I was telling her about how I'm getting on in my psychic developing circle, and I said, I'm starting to get names. And she just said, well, can you guess the, the name of my uh, boyfriend's mum? And she goes, I'll give you a clue. It starts with M. And I said, oh, I wish you hadn't said that. And right. I just said, Mary. And she goes, well, how did you know that? I said, <laughs> oh, all right, it was because you said M. And she said, okay, well, give, give me the name of, uh, of, of Chris's, her boyfriend's dad. And then as soon as she said that, I saw an image of my own father, who is called Brian, so I just said to my daughter, Brian. And she goes, oh, my God, that's exactly his name, Brian, <laughs> you see? So that's how they work. They give you names of people you know, you see? Yeah, yeah. Now, going back to um, the Sally Morgan thing, um, there, there is a video of her coming off stage taking out an earpiece, and I think this is kind of something that, again, Paul Zenon very much um, focuses on. And I think Paul has got a valid point, but there's – there's actually arguments and counter arguments with this um, because first of all, uh, yes, she was coming off stage and she was pulling an earpiece out of her ear. But the, the counter argument would be if she was doing, if she was pulling out the, um, the wire from her ear um, because she's being kind of being fed information, wouldn't she want to keep that secret and wouldn't she want to cover up her ear and not pull it out in front of the camera? Because it was very obvious that the camera was right in, right in her face and she was pulling it out in front of the camera uh, with no yeah. shame or no kind of um, scruples about it. It's kind of like... No attempt to conceal. Yeah, no, yeah, no attempt to conceal. So surely if it was for um, nefarious reasons, she would either cover it up or she would kind of put a shawl over her head, wait till she's in the dressing room and then take it out. Why would she take it out in, in, in front of a camera? But then um, another argument would be, if you're a genuine medium, why the hell have you got a wire in your ear on stage at all? If it was me, I don't care what the reason is, what the stage manager says or what the production team says, I'm not having a wire in my ear because that opens up the floodgates for sceptics. Um, you know, if it's time to if it's time to wrap up and they need a break or something, flash the lights or something, or have somebody down below, you know, flashing a torch or something, you know, I don't want anything in my ear. So I think she was I think she was maybe naive and maybe foolish to have the wire in her ear, but um, it was actually my friend um, Voodoo Mick actually who pointed out why would she take it out with a camera right in her face if if you know there was an attempt to conceal because obviously she wasn't concealing it and also i mean if i was a skeptic i mean i could i could put myself in their shoes in fact martin robbins is the only skeptic who's actually been honest enough to say this why didn't they as soon as they suspected that um, Sally Morgan was doing something like this, based on this hearsay evidence they heard, mm. hearsay anecdote that had been broadcast on, which Irish TV covered. The thing to do is, just, her the next show, anyone got a radio scanner? Mm. Let's go to her next show, let's, just yeah. do, let's actually do what James Rabbit did with Peter Popoff, and yeah. actually get the evidence first before accusing her. Or, or actually, if you're in the audience, kick up a fuss stand up and say i'm sorry but i'm hearing this being said outside and it's repeating because then you could then have a few people and there probably would be some people who would do this in the audience who would immediately rush out the fire exits rush out the doors and see if there's somebody out there with a the radio and if there is somebody out with a the radio then you've got a bang bang to rights end of story because yeah. honestly if if she was actually caught red-handed the way pop-off was i would say kick her out drum her out of the entire business forever mm. she's guilty Get, get you know kick her out. I would actually be 100% behind the skeptics on that. But mm. the, the very fact that they didn't even understand the necessity to get, actually gather real evidence before making accusations is just an illustration of their own self delusion. Yeah, I've got a funny story about radio scanners actually. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for uh, it. This is, it's quite a funny one actually. Um, there's a, a medium called Susan Devere in Harlow, and um, she was doing the Harlow Playhouse, and some bugger had got hold of a radio scanner, which um, also kind of like uh, it's a two way radio basically, so she, they could also um, broadcast, and they did. So in the, she was she was doing her clairvoyant thing with an audience in Harlow Playhouse, and some bugger with a scanner was going. Ooh. and even susan herself was kind of wondering what's going on with the spirits around but apparently no it was just some jackass with a with a, a radio 
Oh dear! Did that interfere with their demonstration? Yes, that, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It kind of like it, it picked up on the speakers. It picked up on the um, the um, theatre speakers somehow. They'd managed oh, to God. kind of like because she was using a wireless microphone. <laughs> they'd kind of like someone else had, had somebody with obviously tech um, kind of skills managed to scan into the frequency of the playhouse and then over the over the theatre um, speakers just do a type. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I have to say, I've and they couldn't seen... get rid of it. They couldn't well, get rid of it. I've I've never seen any other medium <laughs> use uh, earpieces or anything. I mean, um, again, going, fa- going back to pre-internet days, back in the late eighties, mm. I remember seeing a guy called Gordon Higginson, who was um, the head of the Spiritualist National Union. Have you heard of him, Ben? Yeah, yes, I have. I've, I've heard that name. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't know much he was about it. No. One of the well probably the top guy of the 20th century as far as doing media, physical medium. Well, he also was a physical medium, I understand. Um, there's very little YouTube footage of him, unfortunately. There is a little bit, but not a lot, because um, it's all VHS tapes and things in those days. But uh, I remember going to see a demonstration of him uh, at Uxbridge Civic Centre in the late 80s, and I went with a friend. And um, it's the amount of information that he pulled out. Uh, you know, and, and again, you'd have to... Either say, either everyone in the audience was plants or, or something like that, or, or he was getting it from some other way, you know, supernatural, something like that. But, you know, he, he said to this guy uh, that was there sitting in the audience, and he said, um, you, sir, you were before you came out tonight, you were not wearing the coat that you've presently got on. In fact, mm. you came out of your house, you got in your car, and you decided that this coat wasn't comfortable, so you went back into your house, you took off your coat, you threw it on the bed and your car keys, you went to your wardrobe, you got out another coat, you then put it on, then you grabbed your car keys and came out in your car, and the bloke said, yeah, that's absolutely right. And he says, and your car is now parked below us in the car park below the building. And he says, and my helpers, meaning his spirit guides, are just going down to the multi-story car park below the building now. And they're just identifying your car for me. And they've come back and it's a red blah, blah, blah type of car mm-hmm. with a registration number PYE71. And he, and he actually couldn't get the whole registration plate. <laughs> He, he, he said something, something, then he said the last letter because he wasn't quite clear on the last two digits or something like that of the registration plate. But he got it pretty 99.5% accurate and everyone was totally mm. gobsmacked. And this guy also used to give out people's door numbers, used to give out phone numbers and everything, you know. He, he was that good. And and I remember talking to a guy I worked with the next day and saying how bowled over by I was by this medium. And he goes, oh, he's a fake, he's a fake. And I said, well, listen, if he's a fake, how does he do it? And he goes, I don't know. So, you know, that's the <laughs> yeah. first thing. If, if, you know, I don't know what. B- b- before you declare it a fake, please tell me how they do it, you know. And, and OK, he might have said if, if he came out with the first argument, oh, he's using an earpiece and the information fed back. But at least it opens up a dialogue. OK, let's look into this further then. But the fact is he goes, I don't know, but it's definitely a fake. It's just... Well, you're destroying yourself, aren't you, in that kind of sceptic kind of yeah. approach. But the problem is, what the sceptic will say is, what the, the the answer you'll often get when you say, well, you can't explain it, I'll say, it's the burden of proof is on you to explain how he does it, not on how to, me to explain how he's a fake. So in other and words, also, the, the fake is the default position. So uh, basically, your, 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 this particular medium is actually guilty until proven innocent because of this, this burden of proof argument, which, again, is, is very arbitrary from a kind of a moral point of view. Why, why should the burden of proof only be one way? Mm, mm. And then if that doesn't work, they'll fall back on the coincidence line. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Tell you, yeah, I mean, I could tell you a bit about that. Um, they'll say, well... It's, he's not cold reading. They, they, they know he's not cold. Well, then it's just a coincidence, isn't it? He just happened yeah. to say something which coincidentally resembled what was really true. And that, that again, is the ultimate cop-out for the sceptics. And it's, it's another area of their fallacy because to say any, anything that is physically possible in this universe can happen. You can, it doesn't matter how unlikely it is. If it's physically possible, however unlikely it is, to, you can never, ever say that can never happen. And there's a great book called Beyond Coincidence, which really, really opened my eyes. And it made me realize that some skeptics will call coincidence on things, but then they will not actually define a statistical ceiling above which they will not use that explanation. So, for example, um, <coughs> there's a, I, I, I had got into a debate with a guy called Dr. Paul Rogers about this at the, one of the ASAP conferences. And I said, he was like pulling out the... That he was pulling, he was pulling the coincidence joker out of his sleeve over something. And I said, right, well, supposing 
you know a guy who won the national lottery. You, you, you think that's a coincidence? And he says, of course, yes, it's people win it by chance. What if he, I said, what if the same man won it the following week? And the following week after that? What if the same man won the national lottery five weeks in a row? Would you call that a coincidence? And he'd say, no, of course not. That's far too unlikely to happen by chance. I say, right, where's the cutoff point? Mm. Where is the statist- statistical ceiling above which you would say? And he says, well, it's kind of, uh, and he could not give me an actual figure on it. He couldn't actually s- state exactly where the cutoff point was, which means, in a sense, he could call, he could pull, he could pull a coincidence line any time for any reason, for any, for anything, no matter how unlikely. And until he actually states, I think until there's an agreed uh, level, you could put it in p-values or percentages or use Bayesian analysis, whatever you like. Until there's an actual level <laughs> where everyone has agreed, below that level that could be a coincidence, and above it it can't. To use the coincidence line is essentially it's an, unfal- it's an unfalsifiable hypothesis, and that's yeah. another of the many sceptical fallacies. I've got, I've got a small story actually about one of um, Neil's workshops that I did. I don't think Neil was there on this, this particular one. So this was back in I think about June or July time at the High Wycombe Paranormal, and I was doing a um, a kind of ESP kind of tele um, what's the word telekinesis not telekinesis that's moving objects um, telepathic is telepathic the word telepathic as I call it yeah te- telepathic and ESP type workshop and um, Ben you're, you're well aware of psi cards aren't you kind of like these um, cards like created the, the, in the 1920s the Zeneca some, things yeah Zeneca cards, yeah. Zeneca cards. They're, yeah, they're, they're kind of different names Zeneca cards psi cards and they've got like squares and triangle and kind of um, curly things uh, wavy lines and they're in the 1920s and the idea is that one person holds them up where the other person can't see it and they're trying and transmit it and that the other person's got to kind of write down or draw the shape of what they think they're getting now these particular psi cards um, as i call them um the the original pack in the 1920s was kind of five so you'd have a one in five chance but i like to kind of like up it a little bit and make it a bit harder i actually created 10 uh, different symbols myself so they were my kind of designs and I, i kind of printed them out onto onto cardboard now a friend of mine called indigo um, was doing this amongst the group and she scored 100%. I've never, ever, ever come across somebody who scored 100%. It's good to get maybe two, three, four. Um, she got one in ten correct ten times in a row. And we actually worked that out to be 10 to the power of 10, one in a trillion chance of that happening. Well, what a coincidence. Actually. What a coincidence. That's an amazing coincidence, isn't it? Well done. The, The person that she was working with was called Steve, and he does kind of like ghost boxes and scientific. He's a very rational guy, very kind of scientifically driven guy. He was making darn sure that she couldn't see the cards. And I I was watching what was going on, and she was even shutting her eyes as she was getting this. So she she wasn't even looking at the cards. And they weren't in collusion, because Steve is not like that. And Neil knows Steve, and Mm, Neil knows that Steve is not like that. And I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I was asking people, okay, how many people have got one right? And, you know, most people put hands up. How many people two, right? A few hands went up. How many people got three, right? A few hands went up. Four, five, six. I was almost about to give up on like seven, eight, nine. And I'd noticed um, Indigo still hadn't put a hand up. And, I, and she, she looked at me and she said, I got 100%. <laughs> I got Fantastic. All 10 right. I've never, I've never, ever. Uh, come across that and um, how you know i wish somebody like chris french or you know um james randy or brian cox was there because i'd love to hear their ex- explanation as to what was well, going on i know exactly what they would say what <laughs> they, they would say <laughs> they would they would dismiss it they would say either it's a coincidence yeah. or it's it's sensory leakage it doesn't matter your friend steve may have been very very scientifically minded he'd he has done everything he could to prevent sensory leakage he could have said yeah. well she shut her eyes and stuff like this he would he'd still say well um, even so, we, we're still going to say it's sensory leakage, even if there's no evidence of it, because that's the that's the onus. They always use that word onus. <laughs> I, I never heard the word onus until I started talking to skeptics. The onus, the burden of proof, is on you to prove that there was no that there was no sensory leakage. It's not it's not the burden of proof of me to prove that there was. And then and then of course then it will be the coincidence card, the coincidence line will come up. And this, they, they say this every time. I mean. <clears throat> Oh, James Randi has his million dollar challenge, you see. But the thing yeah. about it is, I mean, what, what not many people are aware of, he's actually been sued over that million dollar challenge. He'll just, keep, he'll just keep raising the bar. That's what he'll do. Yeah. It's, the thing about it is that a million, a million dollar challenge is worth nothing unless it is, unless there is a 
the experiment is designed so that um, that he could fail. Mm. And as we've seen from skeptics, they have all kinds of little tricks up their sleeve. Sometimes they're doing it deliberately, and sometimes they do it um, they do it um, unknowingly. But as yeah. I said, we don't, we don't have time to talk about this now. But there's a reason why uh, there is evidence to suggest that. Um, the, the intelligence services and the psychological warfare organisations are behind the sceptic movement. Mm. Mm. Not behind much of it. Well, before we close, I'll just say this quick um, coincidence I had, and then we'll, we'll have to close the show because we're nearly uh, running out of time. Um, bizarre coincidence, whether it was or not, I don't know, but I remember doing some work uh, not that long ago, about two years ago, and I was coming out work late at night and... Uh, I happened to pop to McDonald's, which I don't normally do, just to grab a coffee because I had a long drive ahead of me. And I was going to head down to my girlfriend's on the south coast. Uh, and I was actually heading out of Hemel Hempstead. And so I grabbed a McDonald's uh, coffee. And when I was in there, I, deci- I-, I discovered that McDonald's had changed over years because, as I say, I never go there. And they've got all these kind of computer terminals at the desks and tables. And I thought, crikey, this is just like back to the future. Um, you know, how-, how things have changed here. And, um, and then when I got in the car, I started to think about the Back to the Future films and thought, what a great load of films they were. I really enjoyed them. And uh, then I started to think about how things have changed, you know, since, um, you know, uh, now we're actually at that time in the future where we've got computers and phones and Skype and stuff like that. And anyway, as I got onto the slip road and onto the M, I think it was the M1 motorway, um, I was heading sort of southwards. I could see a vehicle ahead of me. Uh, and this is only sort of five minutes after I got the coffee. And it's a pickup vehicle. And would you believe on the back of the pickup vehicle was the DeLorean car time <laughs> machine? <laughs> and I, I was absolutely totally gobsmacked by the whole thing. I just couldn't believe it. I hear I was thinking about Back to the Future. And then three or four minutes later, I'm actually seeing the Back to the Future car on a pickup truck. Heading it's down a conspiracy, road. Marty. That's it's right. Yeah. Great Scott. <laughs> because what Carl uh, Carl Jung uh, would have would have been really interested in that because he talked about um, these kinds of synchronicities about things that he believed. You see, he wasn't scared to say that's too unlikely to have been coincidence. Yeah. He wasn't scared. He he was willing to accept a statistical ceiling above which he would say there's more. There's something more going on. Yes, and I yep. would agree. I would agree. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, this Beatles story is very interesting, you know, about the Beatle that flies in through his window and lands on the desk just when he's just talk, he's got this guy on the couch and they're going through their, a dream he had about a Beatle or something. Interesting. Um, I was just going to say, uh, kind of rather ironically, um, all these scientific institutions and Oxford kind of um, Cambridge universities, etc., with their, all their sceptics and everything, at the very, very higher levels in what we might call the Illuminati or elite levels, they're all doing occult rituals anyway whether it's kind of like Freemasonic or other kind of secret societies, they are doing esoteric occult rituals. And yet these are the guys saying, oh, no, it's all a load of rubbish. You know, occultism doesn't exist. Doesn't yes. Yeah. So they want the jam, but not giving it out to us, essentially. Really. Precisely. Yeah. I've just noticed, Ben, that we've not covered anything to do with your hospital portal Illuminati. Oh. Well, we <laughs> can't cover everything, unfortunately. It's just two so, hours. But what I was going to say is, is, Ben, would you come back at some point and maybe kind of cover those things that we've not yeah. covered? Anytime, yeah. anytime, Andy. And it's been oh, a great show. We really, really love being on the show. Ben, can you just give uh, viewers uh, some info, viewers, listeners, should I say, some information <laughs> about your uh, own show and your website and uh, any other activities that you might be doing soon? So yes, if you want to find out, find, find out more about me, Google H P A N W O Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. It'll take you to my website, the the main site, and all. It's but the portal to all the other site, the news, the news site, YouTube videos, my own radio show, my fiction and much, much more. So uh, there's plenty there to keep you occupied. It goes back many years, so there's an awful lot. Brilliant. Lovely. Brilliant. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Ben, Emmeline Jones, for taking part in our show tonight. And uh, it just remains for me and Andy to say goodnight and join us again in February for our next show. Thanks very much, all. Good night. Thanks very much. And uh, do you. log on to www.tunedinevents.co.uk for more events that I'm doing. Thanks, oh. guys. And you can listen to repeats of our show and download the podcast on Stitcher, iTunes, and um, I forget the other one, but there we go. And this is the Paranormal Peep Show on the Paranormal UK radio network. Good night.